As I'm walking out of the shop, I get this shotgun shoved in my face. He went, yeah, what do you think of that then? What do you think of that? He said, we got to save yourself now. I said, mate, I mean, listen, why don't you put the gun down? I said, I'll batter all four of you again like I did last the week. What's the nightclub scene like out there, the drug scene out in Thailand? That's awesome. Is there Thai mafia out there? Oh, everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. And next thing I've got half a dozen guys with um, iron bars and hammers and all sorts coming at me. They were not normal. They were part of the Thai mafia, without yeah. a doubt. Tell me about the crazed funeral. I, mean, I suppose it was like a bit of an honour, really, to sort mm. of like to be involved with it. But I've got one eye on this fella. He's rummaging around. He's obviously looking for something. All of a sudden, he's found it. <laughs> he's pulled his Desert Eagle 50 out. Have you ever seen one? And after we went out, it actually kicked off with this group and the security there. And the, the army were actually called in. Because the police couldn't handle it. Is there any one regret you've got? There is one regret. I didn't, it, didn't, it didn't sit very comfortable with me for a long time. Marcus, welcome back to the show, mate. Thank you very much for having me back. Yeah, what? Uh, well, the first one we did in April was an absolute blinder, and by all the comments, everyone's like, we need a part two, so we're <laughs> back today, mate. Yeah, wicked. Happy days. This, um, I think everyone wants to dig a little bit deeper into your life. It's uh, a fascinating life and an eventful life you've lived. Do you remember the first actual fight you ever had? Uh, as At what age? I mean, I remember fights as a child. I was getting bullied. Yeah. Um, but I remember, I think the, most, the first serious fight I, I was involved in, and when I say serious, see, when I was 13, I was a bit of a, I was a, like I said, I was a tall lad, I was about 5'11". So I was knocking around with older lads. I just naturally, I'd had friends that were like 18 or 19. So it was a bit weird. And I was, uh, we was out in Ramsgate one day and uh, my friends got involved in a fight outside the Dole office, right? And this guy pulled a knife out and stabbed my friend in the stomach. And, and I, didn't, I didn't really have time to think about it. I just, I just ran into the middle of it. So... I ran in, uh, grabbed the knife off of him. I, I broke the knife in, in two, threw it across the across the car park, and and dragged this guy off of my friend. And then I had to take my friend to the hospital. He actually got he got stabbed right in um, right in here. And he, they said when we got him to the hospital, they said if it had gone like just a few millimeters more, he would he would have been gone. Oh, yeah. You know, um, so that was yeah. But and, I've, and and the really really weird thing about that is reaction. I've always said this about people: you can train people as much as you want. But you can't train someone to react like that, or, you, or it's not as easy to be trained to react, because you either you either run towards a problem or you run away from a problem. Mm. And majority of people, it's our it's our reaction to run away from mm. it. You know, that's early years. So you were what thirteen? You're talking like seventies here, late seventies, mid seventies, mm. whatever. Yeah, How yeah. have you seen knife crime evolve over the years, especially over the last 10, 15 years? Really, it's, I mean, it's when when everyone says it's evolved. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm for sure it's got worse. But it's always been bad. It's never been great. I mean, I, I, I can think back of my own experiences. Um, when I was a young doorman, I remember working in a, the Acer Clubs upstairs. There was a we had we had lots of really Where's this these, in Kent Acer yeah, Clubs in, in, in Margate. Margate. So we had all these dress restrictions. We had like a list. It was like a menu of what you. I mean, it was a shithole club, yeah. but it had this list of what you couldn't. You couldn't wear a motorbike jacket. You couldn't wear boots. You couldn't wear this. You had to have a collar on. Anyways, the guys turned up one night and he was dressed okay, except for he had a motorbike jacket on. So the, the the reception staff said to him, "Sorry, sir, you know you can come in." He said, "But but you can't you can't bring your, you can't come in with a motorbike jacket on, but you, we'll put that in the cloakroom and it'll cost you fifty p, right?" And see how long ago it was, and the guy went, "I'm not I'm not taking it off," and I said, "We can't come in then," and uh, so he pulled a knife out on me, so he wanted to stab me over fifty p, yeah. basically. And so I'm standing, I've, he's out in this hallway with a knife out, going threatening to stab me. And I'm like this, and I'm not quite knowing quite how to tackle him because I'm only about, eight, about 18, 19, mm. hadn't got a lot of experience. Anyway, luckily for me, um, one of the doormen who wasn't working that night walked up the stairs behind him, saw what was going on and just run over to him, grabbed him in like in a big bear hug. We pulled the knife off of him. I mean, and, and to be honest, in those days, you know, normally he would have got a bloody good yeah. <laughs> batter in yeah. for it, but we didn't. We did it all by the book. So we, we, we marched him downstairs because the doorman who'd just come up from the street, he said, oh, there's a, there's a police van in the ice street, mm. which you don't often see now. <laughs> he says, a police van sitting at the bottom of the ice street. So let's just take him out there and we'll take the knife, take him and we'll get him nicked. So no, I'm happy with that. You know, so we went out there. So we marched him down to the police. I said, look, this fellow's just threatened me with this knife because he wouldn't put his, pay 50p to put his jacket in. And, they, and they, they slung him in the back of the van. They right, we'll deal with that. Thank you very much. We'll come back for a statement later. So we thought, job done. Anyway, it gets about one o'clock in the morning and the police turned up. And I thought, are oh, you back for that statement? He said, no, just thought I'd better let you know. We've let him go. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, we've let him go. We've given him his knife back as well. 
I said, oh, great. I said, so now he's really pissed off, so now you've given me his knife back. I said, what did you do that for? He said, oh, he's a, it turns out he's a merchant seaman. He's allowed to carry a knife. Oh, I said, he's allowed to threaten people with it as well. You know, I said, because I weren't too chuffed about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, luckily he didn't come back. But, I mean, nice as a couple to warn us, I suppose. I mean, he could have just waited outside for me at 2 o'clock and gone, mm. you know. But, yeah, it's, so and one, around about the same time as that, one of my good friends, um, uh, his name was uh, uh, Lee Humphrey. Uh, he was one of two brothers I used to knock around with. And it was his wedding anniversary. He took his wife out. He's driving along Margate in his car. Car cuts him up. So he's bibbed the car. The car's then slowed down. He's over the car. And he's going on like this, yeah. you know, silly silly buggers, you know. Anyway, and he just pulled over. And this other car pulled over. And he gets out to the fellow and he's like, what are you doing? And the guy just went, without a word, stabs him straight in the stomach um, with a, a flick knife. And um, anyway, my mate falls to the floor. He thought he'd been punched. He thought he'd been punched in the stomach. And this guy drives off. And anyway, in the end, they, they somehow managed to catch the guy. Uh, he was only he was only nineteen years old as well, and it was the second wounding I think they'd be, he was been nicked for. My friend actually went into hospital. Is the, they, they pushed it in that hard that the knife had actually cut the um, artery going down the spine mm. to the legs. Jeez. Um, and uh, within, I mean, he, he collapsed in the hospital. They had to keep him in. Um, his legs went like purple. Um, he died slowly. What they did was they they had to amputate his legs off f- first at the knees, um, and he was unconscious for weeks. And then they woke him up. So he woke up and he saw stumps. Then his stumps got gangrene. So then they had to cut his stumps shorter, and uh, until in the end the gangrene took him. So it took him six weeks and five days to die from that stab wound. From that, just from a car. And, there, and his family had to sit and watch him be chopped up piece by piece as he basically as a gangrene spread for his body and that guy got three years youth custody Bloody and hell. came out and probably stabbed another load yeah. of people yeah, yeah yeah so this so the knife crime that everyone's talking about now to me it's been going on forever you know i, I think yeah i think more people i think it's i think it's more publicized now that's what i mean it's probably more publicized i think yeah i think that's the difference with everything now i think yeah. i think we generally i mean look we know because the world has become such a small place yeah. everyone's got a camera phone the stories of around social media yeah. so everyone knows about silly things you know someone farted and everyone knows about yeah. it so it's like yeah, yeah. you know but the, but yeah i think i i think i think knife crime's always been there i think violence has always been there but yeah i think to a certain degree it has got worse but we're more aware of it now. Mm. Did you used to pat everyone down before you'd come into the clubs? No, not everyone. No, no. I mean, I mean, in in more recent years, um, like you said, when this when there was the knife crime thing was, I suppose probably about five five yeah five years ago or maybe more. Um, I mean, certain clubs that we had problems with. Mm. Then we did put metal detectors yeah. on the doors, and we started using them. So the metal detectors you'd actually walk through, or the other no, one you no, just so packed someone some down. Some clubs, and... some clubs were lucky enough to have the walk through, but not very many because they're really expensive and they're also hard to set up. Yeah. And then you're, you literally got to take everyone's got to take everything Stop out of their pockets. Yeah, it's like being at the airport, isn't it? really slows it down. And I mean nowadays it's, it wouldn't really matter because it's hard to going in the clubs. Yeah. But in them days, you know, it's queues trying to get in. You're trying to get them in quick. But what I like, what I like to do is use the ones because. They're not, they're not brilliant, but the ones are easy to use mm. and the ones are a good visual deterrent. So if, if you're queuing up to go into a club and you're carrying something you shouldn't be and you see someone wanding mm. people over randomly, you know, it's, it's going to sort of put you off trying to get in. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not, we've had people, we've, we found knives outside in the flower pots and stuff yeah. where people have like, they've dumped it out there or yeah. they've, they've stashed it outside in case they go out for a row, yeah. you know, but um yeah, I mean it's yeah it's something you definitely got to be on top of, and I would I would rather. I mean, I gave I I bought a whole shitload of these um, uh, metal detectors, and I gave them. I made sure every little pub had them. Yeah, and I said to my doorman, please, for your own protection, for the customers' protection, just one. Don't have to want everyone down, but mm. just do some random ones so mm. people see you that you're doing it. It's a deterrent. But you know what? They just get lazy. Have you ever been stabbed? Um, uh, stabbed. Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I think yeah, in the, in the arm once. Um, but I think I was aiming for something else. Um, I've, I've stopped a lot of stabbings. I've got in the middle of a load of stabbings in bars and things. Um, I've been glassed a hell of a lot of times, um, and and sometimes by the most unusual people. Um, <laughs> well, once was by there was one guy kicking off um, when he had a little tiny girlfriend. She was like five foot one, little blonde, pretty thing. You'd never think butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, but she got this glass and she smashed it on the on the bar. Went to shove it in a guy's face. I saw all this sort of going on because her, her boyfriend was arguing with this guy. I jumped in front of it and she shoved it straight in my arm and a muscle popped out. And and the funny thing really with that one was, I mean, she was 
she actually got arrested for it. And I said to the police, just don't, it's not worth it. I yeah. said, because when he goes to court, it's going to look so stupid. I said, yeah. five foot one little dinky blonde. And there's this me, like this like 19 and a half stone, six foot two Hulk. <laughs> And I'm going to be standing there going, she hurt me. <laughs> right, you know. And, and, and that's what happened. Yeah. She went into court. She went, I didn't do it. Yeah. She cried. And they went, oh, you're not guilty. Yeah. You couldn't possibly do that. Yeah. But she was nasty. Mm. You know, I've had, a, I've had a few more. I've been very lucky. I had a, one with a pint glass put over this side of my face. And it, and it was sort of, it was smashed sort of down on my face. So luckily not shoved into me. Yeah. I mean, that's the worst kind. But when you, when it's broken sort of down on you, so it, it shattered and it, and it literally cut me there. And it just missed my eye, and then it cut me there. Um, you know, so but it was yeah, it was a real close one. I could have lost, could have lost. And that eye. one there, were you in the middle of a tear up, or was it some come from behind? Um, I think it was the middle of a big tear up. Okay, yeah, in the middle of a big tear up. And someone just ran through, and went. Tsh! You know, um, I mean, yeah, I've seen I've seen some horrific. I mean, I, I remember one guy was uh, in a queue, I think, just trying to get in the club, and he uh, he asked someone for the time. Mm. You got the time, mate. He just went tsh, glass straight in his face, and it sliced his nose in two. It was like, you know, um, I mean, th th that's the trouble when you when people use glasses. There's there's no control over what you're going to yeah. do. There is no control. You know, you you don't know if they're going to take their eye out. You don't know if you're going to kill them. You don't know if they're going to bleed to death. You know, I've seen other people get hit in an artery, and they'll they'll hit the deck like in seconds yeah. because of blood loss, and there'll be a fountain coming up this high, you know, and to see that happening, like ah, shit, you know, it's like psh, 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 blood every mm. spurting everywhere. I mean, we had a. Uh, we had a one, 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 one guy actually glassed himself. Um, he was trying to commit suicide in the <laughs> well, toilet. Okay. This is this is actually quite funny, really. Um, so this is a game in Frank's nightclub. So I'm, um, we've had two attempted suicides that I know of in this club. So the music wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but this one guy, he's, um, he's, he's gone in the toilet. He's very depressed, obviously. He's got a pint glass. He's broken it. And then he's, he's tried to cut his own throat with it. So he's run the glass across here. Right, he's really just scratched it, right? Um, but then he thought, and he started, it did bleed a little bit. So then he's, he's decided to do it again, a bit harder. So he, again. And then he had an epileptic fit and rammed it in the side of his head <laughs> and fell out the toilet door. So all everyone saw in the toilet was this guy with a glass stuck in his head and blood coming out of his throat, right, going like this, you know. And um, <laughs> we got called in, and of course, we all go, oh shit, he's like, you know, slit his throat, yeah. he's it. And the ambulance man turned up and he went, that's the most pathetic suicide attempt I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he just wiped all the blood off and it was just a scratch and a hole in his head with a glass. Yeah. Would you have, do you have more fear if someone pulled a knife on you or a gun? Uh, do you know, I mean, one of my biggest fears has always been knives um, because, because you can, look, let's face it, how easy is it and how quiet is it? You know, when you get in a when you're in a very, very, very packed nightclub and you're literally and you're trying to squeeze through, someone's only going, yeah. you know, that that's what they gotta do. Yeah. In the right place, no one would even know who it was. I wouldn't even know who it was. So that's always been uh, that's always been that's always an ever present fear, which is why a lot of my guys, you know, in the later years started wearing stab vests. And to be honest, they should. Because, like they said, knife crimes escalating, people are getting sillier, you know, and, and, and lots of people are charlied up and coked up, whatever. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't blame anyone. I think it's, I just think, I mean, I, I just didn't like wearing them because they didn't fit under me like for a top. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did go through a, a, a stage where I was wearing bulletproof, proper uh, ballistic bulletproof vests, because I, like when I was having all the problems with the people trying to shoot me. Um, and that was stab proof, bulletproof, and everything proof. But it was like, yeah, it was like, it was like, it was like wearing armor. Yeah. It was massive. And it was heavy and hot. And when you, you know, when you're having tear ups on the on the doors there, and did you ever, you're on guard there. Are you ever off guard when you're walking down the street with your family or uh, you're jumping in the motor or you're going for a nice bit of lunch or well, whatever? Yeah, I mean, of course, to a certain degree. But most of my life, you're always getting this. It's like, even now, my wife says, if we walk into a restaurant, she knows I will not sit with my back to the door. Yeah. She, if we've got a table in the corner, she'll, she'll go and there's your chair. She knows exactly where I'm going to sit because I'll be sitting in the corner so I can see Clock everyone, everyone coming in, everyone. Yeah. Running, and we've gone in, we've gone out for, obviously, obviously I take my wife out for nights out, but I, I go in a bar for a night out and straight away in my brain, I can't help doing it. Yeah. I'm listening to conversations. Yeah. I'm sussing out who's doing what. And, and I can see the badly behaved people and I can see the potential problems yeah. as soon as I walk into a building. But that's because I've done it for so long yeah. that you can't switch off, yeah. you know? And something, sometimes, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons when I, um, when I sort of discovered Thailand uh, when I was about when I was 37, um, and I sort of fell in love with Thailand, and I started going over there. I used to love at first. I used to love my breaks over there because I used to. It was getting away from the clubs, getting away from where everyone knew me as Marcus the doorman. Mm. 
So to go there for a few weeks and blow off steam and see some mates was great. But what happened in the end was it just sort of it just sort of happened over there. Mm. So I ended up breaking up fights in clubs. I ended up getting to know all the doorman. Um, it just it just follows me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And if there's a and I and I can't because I'm sort of just one of these people that hates bullies as well. It's it's got me in a lot of trouble. It's I mean nearly got me killed really. I mean I. I, I can tell you another one. I was, I was in, um, in Thailand one day. We'd uh, only been there a, a, a day or two. Met up with a friend. It was four o'clock in the morning. We'd been drinking all evening. But we weren't, we wasn't blotto. We yeah. were just happy. Yeah. And we're in this bar. And this guy, and it was a really nice, happy atmosphere in this bar. And this guy came in. And he was a like, little short, stocky guy. Um, didn't know it at the time, but it turns out he was Australian. Anyway, he's he's marching through the bar. And he's barging into everybody. He's just not, he's no, no politeness about the guy at all. No manners. And near me was a, a quite an old boy with a drink, and he and he knocked him on his ass. I mean, the, the drink went flying. The guy was on the deck, and he never even stopped. He just marched straight onto yeah. the loo. So anyway, I, was, I just I get hung with people like that. Yeah. So and it was a really narrow uh, little na little narrow walkway on both sides. So I waited for him to come out, and uh, I said to my mate, I said, oh, he's, he's going to have to. Uh, if he comes this way, I'm going to have a word with him. But anyway, he, he didn't come my way. He walked the other way around out the club, and he went out. And as he left, you could see the whole atmosphere went back to like relaxed and normal. Five minutes later. He's back in the door again, and he's and he's folding up. He's coming up my side now. So I thought, right, okay. So I stepped out and blocked it. I mean, he's, he's actually got to say something or just push me out of the way, and that's not going to happen. So he went, he went, excuse me. I went, oh, I said, you do speak then. I said, you, you were here five minutes ago, and you'd want to knock that old boy over. I said, didn't even apologise. I said, I bought him a drink. He went, was oh, yeah, a problem? And I thought, and then when you like, when you've worked the door as long as yeah. I have, you know that when someone. Is that when their reaction is that, because yeah. I wasn't really being horrible, I was just sort of saying, you know, but when he's like, is that a problem? I thought, he don't want to talk. <laughs> so I just smashed an elbow straight around his chops. <laughs> and, uh, and elbows have worked great. Uh, you don't break your hand. And uh, he just went flying across the club, sort of half unconscious. And of course, the immediate reaction was all the security was coming in to get me. Um, but then the fact that they sort of knew me anyway, and the fact that every customer in the area went, no, no, not him, him. him quality. He's the one that knocked that old boy over five minutes ago. Yeah. So he got dragged out, and it took three of them to drag him out. Fair play to him, and uh, and he had three attempts to get him back in. So anyway, one of my friends who I was with, a friend I was with, uh, he said, I mean, "I'm quite really relaxed about it. I was too chilled, really." And um, and uh, this, my mate, my mate went, "I'm gonna have a look outside because it, it, outside, sorry, outside yeah. goes out onto Walking Street, which yeah. is like a main yeah. track." Anyway, he come back in. He went, ah, "I think there's four of them waiting for us outside." <laughs> So okay, all right. So and and I was and in those days I was wearing my lovely gold Rolex and I didn't even bother taking it off. That's how stupid I was. So I swear, four of them, two of us, you know, <laughs> had worse odds. So I walked out there all nonchalant, really, and and not prepared for what was going to happen. So they're on the other side of the street. I've come out of the club, and I and they've just come running at us, literally running straight at us, head on. So I went running straight at them. I just thought, yeah, boom, attack is the best form of defence. Yeah. Anyway, I managed to clock this really big guy. And then all of a sudden, something hit me from behind. Because what they'd done, there was eight of them and not four. So four came from the front and another two from either oh, side at the back. Right, yeah. So I just got absolutely piled on. And, and next thing, I'm getting fists and knees and things. And I'm shit. And I'm, sort of, I'm bent over double, but... Um, I'm having getting one of the best beatings of my life. I really was, I was and I kept thinking that. Right? <laughs> but but at the same time, I was sort of trying to back up to yeah. get back to the club. So I I managed to while I was getting beaten, I managed to somehow get back to the entrance of the club, and I stood up finally, and I went, "Is that all you got?" Yeah, and I really didn't mean that. <laughs> I really wanted to laugh. I hope that's all you got. <laughs> but they they sort of looked at me like I was mental, and they just ran off in the crowd. And I was like, "Oh, I looked at him in the face." And my teeth have gone nearly straight through my bottom lip. I got like, and I had to go and have a. And at the time, I was on blood thinners, so I had to go to the hospital and have a brain scan done because I've got so many wallops to the head, and and I had to have seven stitches on the inside of my lip. It was a real out of air by now. Um. Anyway, and, and and it was it really annoyed me because that was my that was my safe haven place. That yeah. was my Thailand was where I'd relaxed. Yeah. Now I've made a load of enemies, right? And I'm thinking I don't even remember their faces because it was all happening in such a blur. And they might live there. So yeah. I might have to, like, I might bump into them next week yeah. or tomorrow. So anyway, I said it, I set myself a mission to try and find who they were. So I went back to the club the next day and they didn't want to tell me too much. But anyway, I asked about, and then someone said, like, Australians, and then someone said something the other. Anyway, and, I, and, I, and it's sort of, it's sort of it's the, the thought of it, I didn't find out exactly who they were straight away. But a couple of months have gone by, I'm out there again, and I bump into this Australian guy, a really, really lovely guy, in amazing shape. His name, I'll give him a mention, his name's Nick Carra. Um, he's one of the nicest, nicest guys, but one of the toughest people I've ever met. Yeah. He used to be the Australian K1 champion. Okay. okay. He's, this man can have a row. Yeah. Anyway, so we're in a nightclub and, and I get chatting to him. And he said to me, he said, I think you might have met a few of my friends. 
I said, uh, he goes, oh, they're really nice guys. He said, you just, just didn't meet them right. And I was like, I said, you're the ones that jumped all over me. <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't really want to meet him again. Yeah, yeah. I said, but I want to. I actually want to put it to bed. I want it. I want this over with. I said, because I don't want it. He said, well, you know, because I, I said I'm trying to find him. He said, you've been asking around about him, and I said, yeah, I have. Because only because not because I want to have a, a rematch. Yeah. I want it to just put this to bed. Like, yeah. It's done. And he said, well, I think I can help you there. He said, I know them all. He said, I train most of them. So anyway, uh, it turns out one of the guys also who was in the fight is another guy called Judd Reed. Now, Judd Reed, they'll tell you how good quality this guy is. He was the winner of a Kumite competition. That's where it's a 100-man fight off. He was the winner. He was the winner? Yeah. So he's one of the, one of the eight I was fighting. Glad. So, I, you know, I wasn't really in for it. There was no chance yeah. of winning, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm quite, when I found out all this, actually, I thought, actually, I've done quite well just getting a good beating, <laughs> you know. But anyway, so I end up having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the, the original guy. I think his name was Archie. Yeah, it was Archie. The he's the one who come in the club. Yeah, the, the little stocky yeah, one, yeah, right? Yeah. And, when I, and I met him at Nick's, Nick's apartment, and, uh, and it was a bit weird because, you know, he said, right, this is Archie, this is Marcus. And I walked in and he went, I thought you was I thought you was taller. I said you was laid down. <laughs> uh, you know, but um, yeah. We, we what sort was of... going through your head when you went and met him? You're thinking, right? I just want to, like you say, you want to nip it in bed. Yeah, but there's a bit of revenge there. Thinking, yeah. You, well, the thing bit. was, I I sort of, I mean, I, I under, if you if you unthink like as if you, you unthink it with your dormant's head, you know, this guy was out. He was obviously four o'clock in the morning. Everyone's drunk by yeah. four in the morning, so he's had a drink. I've had a drink, but I'm not the one who started it. But he's gone out. He's gone out after being whacked. Yeah. And rung all his mates up. So what would you do if you're out in a, and you rung, if your mates rung you up and went, oh, some just great yeah. geezer just elbowed me around the head? Yeah. I'll go and get him. Yeah. So they only came and responded for their friend. Yeah. When they actually found out, because what happened was I met him, I said, I met him first at Nick's house and we and we just sort of shook hands begrudgingly and sort of went, oh, I'll leave it there then sort of thing. But then all the other guys, I invited around my house for a barbecue. Because I know the Aussies, Aussies love a barbecue, yeah, don't barbie, they? Yeah, barbie, mate. <laughs> so, so, and I met all the other guys. And I actually made, we, and I, one of them, like, they're all coming up to me one at a time going, sorry about that, I'll punch you in the back of the head. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it was, they were all apologising. Well, we didn't know what that dickhead had done. You know, yeah. so they all knew the story by then. And they, they, they all knew that I was really doing what they'd have probably done. Yeah. Um, so they were actually quite apologetic. And I actually had many good nights out for the next few years with those guys. Quality. You know, we actually had some, yeah, some right good times. And what what rough gear was this? Oh, um, oh my God. Uh, we're not talking in the 90s here, late 90s. No, we no, later like than that. I think we're talking 2000s. Two, uh, two, uh, yeah, 2010 maybe. Okay. Mm. And what was your lifestyle like out there? It was pretty awesome because uh, I was, I had, you know, I was making, I was making very good money at the time. Uh, that's when my business, you know, sort of, I went out to, I, saw, I, I think I started, I bought my house out there. I had my house built in about 2000 or 2002, something mm -hmm. like that. So, um, and I, I was earning really good money with security. Then I, then I started buying up houses out there and renting them out. So I had another income out there. So when I used to go there, um, yeah, I had loads of disposable cash and it was fun. And I had an amazing time. And yeah. I, I don't really regret most of it. I, I, I probably would have managed the money a bit better, you know. Um, but yeah, other than that, no, I, I, had an, I had an awesome time. There. So were you doing what, months at a time, a couple of months at a time? Uh, or were you doing six months stints? No, or? no, I'd never do six months. Because yeah. what, what it was, running the security company and still being a sort of hands-on boss that I was. So I would always try and work it around. I had to be here for bank holidays. So, for instance, you know, April bank holiday is a big one. You know, the May bank holidays, yeah. there's the August bank holidays, yeah. there's Christmas. So at one point, I, would, I was doing it a month on, month off. So I would just do four weeks here, four weeks here, which was actually fun, but it was a bit crazy. Mm. And it cost a lot in airfares. Mm. Um, then I sort of, then later on, I went to six weeks on, six weeks off. Then it was two months on, two months off. As I got better managers and my son was, my son was involved at one point with the business as well. So I could sort of leave a bit longer mm. and not have to worry. So I was always, I was sort of gearing up for a retirement, sort of mm. trying to slow down a bit, you know. And where were you based at? Bangkok, Pattaya, <clears throat> Koh Samui, Pattaya. Kopi? Pattaya. Yeah, yeah basically Pattaya. Our, our house is, our house is um, outside of Pattaya. It's on a, what they call the dark side. Mm. Um, I think I originally called it the dark side because there was no street lamps over there, but it's it's not now. It's, now the town has sort of come out to it, um, so you 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 feel like you're in the town really yeah. now. And what's the nightclub scene like out there? And the drug scene out in Thailand? Oh, it's awesome. I yeah. mean, it's it's awesome. I mean, obviously the drug scene is dangerous because yeah. um, the penalties for that, I mean, is is you know crazy. I mean, one of my friends, um, he got set up by a Russian guy, and uh, he got caught with three quarters of a gram of coke, which this Russian guy had given him. And he was on remand for seven months before, oh. and they had to pay millions of bahts just to get him out. And then he, then when he got out, he was then barred from Thailand for another five years. Couldn't come back. He even got a house there. Wow. So, I mean, some people, if you haven't got the money to buy your way out of it, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, you could end up getting 15, 20 years for a gram of coke. Yeah. You know, so yes, yeah, drugs is not a not a really good option mm. while you're out there. Mm. And there's a lot of corrupt old bill that you can oh, pay off. It's awful. I mean, I, I actually got done. Um, what was it? I got I got stopped for. 
I can't stop a drink driving. And when they first started, because they never used to bother. Mm. And then all of a sudden, they just they discovered um, that, that they could make a lot of money out of it. So anything they can make money out of, they do. But, but like most things, it's like they have a helmet law. So on your motorbike, you're supposed to wear a helmet. But they don't enforce it all the time. So when they don't enforce it for a few weeks, people don't wear their helmets. Mm. So then suddenly they set up roadblocks and everyone's not wearing a helmet, so they make a lot of money. Yeah. Then they leave it again for another few weeks because mm. they don't really want you to wear the helmet. Mm. They just want you to be able to pay for when you're not wearing it. And it's the same with the drink driving. They're rather really that you did have a little drink. Um, not saying they want you drunk, but they, but if they can find so they use the same as Australia, 0.05. Yeah. So for those who don't know, in England it's 0.08. Mm. So it's almost twice as you can almost drink almost twice as much in England as you can out there. So in England, what to one and a half drinks? It's one and a half pints. Um, I think it's one glass of wine or whatever. It's one and half a beer or yeah, something. Yeah, something yeah. like okay. that. Yeah. yeah. But but once you go over the point eight, you're drunk. But over there, it's point point oh five. Right. So literally one bottle of beer yeah. and a half lager of beer, or you know one glass of wine. Yeah. Or, so it's, it's very very strict. As soon as you, I mean, you're not drunk, but you are according to them. <clears throat> so I got pulled up one night. We've been out. I've been out the missus, and then one and then one of her friends had a row with her boyfriend. So out there, you often see three people on a motorbike, even four or five yeah, on a motorbike. Yeah. Well, this particular night, her friend needed to lift home, so I've got a big motorbike. And she, oh, can I jump on the back? So I've got I've got two birds on the back basically, yeah, and I'm yeah. on the front, and I had had a drink. But again, I only blew 0.6, yeah. which in England I'd be sober, but I wasn't in England. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so they wanted to lock me up for the weekend, which I really didn't want because they're horrible little rooms with about 40 people all sweaty and all shoved in there, and. Uh, so I rang everybody I could think of trying to ring someone who'd know someone. And you normally do, you know. So in the end, a couple of people came down. I went, no, no, I know so-and-so. I know this. I know the chief. So in the end, they went, oh, it's going to cost you, what was it? I think it was 20, it was 20 or 21,000 baht. So it's about 500 quid. About four or 500 pound it cost me. And then, and then they gave him my keys back. Well, you can take your bike home now. That's how mad it is. Madness, isn't it's it? It's absolutely mad. Do you know, if you get... If you get sorry to go off the track of the dorm a bit, but yeah. if you, um, I was I was driving up north uh, to one of my charity things one day with the missus in the car, so we're in a bit of a. It's about a thirteen-hour drive, the whole day. So we're bombing along, and it's and they'd set the uh, speed limit on the road was ninety kilometers an hour, so it's not very fast. Mm. I think I was doing like hundred and twenty or something, mm. which again is not very fast. Mm. But I got nicked, so I got pulled over for speeding, and I got in and showed me license, and and he, and he went, and it's four hundred baht. So four hundred baht then is about ten pound. No points, just ten pound. Mm. Give you a ticket. So I got back in the car, poof, off again. 20 minutes up the road, told me I'll go for another one, right? So I'm like, oh no, not again. My missus went, leave it to me, I'll sort this one out. So <laughs> she's gone in there to talk to him, right? And she went, they went, they went uh, you're doing 120 again. Da, da, da. And, she, and she went, well, and they wanted 450 baht, right? So she went, well, it's only 400 down the road. And I'm going, no, don't, <laughs> don't say mention that. Nothing. Don't mention the previous one, you know, because I didn't, I didn't think that was a good idea. Yeah. And the bloke went, oh, you've already been done down the road, yeah? 400 baht. I went, yeah, show me your ticket. Oh, here we go. I showed him the ticket. He went, oh, okay, no fine then. I went, what? He went, God, well, once you, once you pay once, you can speed all day. all day. So I've now got a 13-hour journey I can do in probably seven or eight, yeah, you know what I mean? Quality. I just keep showing the ticket. I would have been done, mate. <laughs> I've paid to speed. And that's it. That's it. How crazy the mm. rules are out there. And what about training out there? What was your lifestyle like? Were you getting up, training, eating yeah. well, just enjoying the beach? Yeah, what was your day-to-day -day like out there? Um, yeah, I was normally up. Normally, it would depend if I had a night out, I wasn't up too early. Yeah. But, um, but obviously, the partying was good out there when I was younger. Um, more recently, I'm more sort of like, I go out there more for my health, really. Um, I get up early. I like to get up about six in the morning, go out for a mountain bike ride, come back, have breakfast, and off to the gym for an, an hour mm. or two. Um, and I love it, yeah. And then trying to, you know, have a nice, sometimes have a nice lazy day down the beach or, you know, it's nice to enjoy, to, nice to be able to relax and nice to be able to take your time about it. Mm. But also, like I said, my, you know, one, one of my big passions out there, obviously, I've mentioned before, is my charity, and I love mm. doing that. So that's, it's always gone sort of hand in hand, you know, Thailand charity, whatever. And, mm. And I just, I love the country, love the people, um, generally. <laughs> mm. And is there, is there Thai mafia out there? Oh, everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. It's, the, I mean, one of the reasons I sold all the houses over there was um, just after I got married um, in 2016. We had 12 houses still then. And um, my, reti my, my idea was to actually retire there because mm. we've got all these houses and I've got the time issues and everything was all, you know, good. And I could have retired. But what happened was we had a tenant moving out. It was the day after I got married. And I was busy doing something. I said, I said to my wife, it was, it was only two doors away from where we actually lived. So I said, could you pop down there and just you know, get the keys and check the house? Anyway, she rings me five, ten minutes later. She says, you, you have got to come down here. The house is wrecked. So I've gone down there and there's two taxi drivers moving this woman's stuff out, a Thai woman. And, um, and my wife is in there arguing with her. And there's, there's, there's a brand new sofa, which I didn't put in five months before. It's now a big rip for it. And there's trash. The place is trashed and there's stuff broken and blinds. And it's, it's just a mess. 
And so I can understand what my wife's arguing about, but I can't understand. I can understand a bit of time, but I can't understand mm. it completely. I knew they weren't getting on. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, one of these taxi drivers like prodded my missus. And I went, whoa, whoa. I said, what are you doing? I said, you don't, you have nothing to do with this house. You don't, she rents it. You don't. You're a taxi mm. driver. Come get out. Mm. And they looked at me like, you know, uh, you know, so anyway, I grabbed these two guys and I escorted them out. And they didn't want to go, so I threw them out. Mm. And I just threw them across the garden. They rung their mates up. And the next thing you know, I've got half a dozen guys with um, iron bars and hammers and all sorts coming at me. And um, and they, they actually attacked my wife first. They punched my wife in the head like she was a geezer. I went to protect her, and there was a motorbike on the driveway. And then I got I got hit I got hit from the side with a bottle in this eye, in my left eye. And, and I, I actually it, it ruined my sight for over a year. I nearly nearly could have nearly lost that eye. Um, I'd be like a big dark patch in my sight for about a year. Um, and the and, and then they I went over I fell over the bike, and then I got five tie guys, five or six tie guys jumping up and down on top of me with iron bars bashing me. I managed to get up, God knows how. I couldn't see anything out of that eye, but and, and I'm sort of getting up and trying to you know. Sort of fight them off, and they they backed off, but they wouldn't go away. And uh, and, and so the guy I just mentioned earlier on, that Nick Carra, um, he was the best man at a wedding. That's how friendly we got. This is the Australian, yeah, the Australian yeah, K1 okay, champion. Qualified. So, and he okay, just yeah. left my house ten yeah. minutes before. So I rang him. I went, Nick, can you come back? I've got a bit of a problem here. <laughs> so he came back and he saw the state of my eye, and he just went loopy, and he steamed into about three of them, and he's put he's given one of them seventeen stitches in his face. I mean, he's just smashed him to bits. Um, so he's had to go to hospital. I've had to go to hospital. The police were called. Anyway. But when the police turned up, they said, have you, you got a red box? I said, what? You got a red box or not? No. Oh, no, well, never mind then. You have to go to the police station. So apparently if you pay for a red box, it's like a police box. So you pay every month some money. Basically, if you get a problem, they're on your side. Ah. Oh, I didn't have a red box. No. This guy, uh, who's um, the, other, the other group of fellas, they've gone to the police station first and made a deal with the, with the police there, the chief of police. So... By the time, even though my Aussie mates, they all knew people in the police. And they went, oh, don't worry, we sort it out. By the time I'd gone to the hospital to see about my eye and then gone to the police station, they took me passport. They want 100,000 baht off me. It's like two and a half grand. I went, what do you want money off me for? I'm the one who's yeah. nearly lost an eye. It was my house. I'm, you know, they punched my missus. Mm. They've, they've wrecked my house. They've attacked. Nah, you pay the money or, or you go to court or you know, you're not going to leave the country. We've got your passport. And we was in there like half a day arguing with the police. Um, I think in the end I settled on 50,000 baht. Which is how much? Uh, it was just like about 1,200 quid or something. Oh, just get it paid. Yeah, just get it paid and get out. And, I, and that, But that really pissed me off. And I was like, do you know, and I was thinking then, I wasn't, I didn't feel old at that time. And I, and how, I was, old, how old were you roughly? Uh, this was only, uh, it was 2016. 16, okay. So. Um, I what, was, mid-50s? Yeah. But I was 50, still yeah. very big and strong yeah. and I just, I was not used to being treated like that. Yeah. And I, you know, I said to my missus, I went, I'm not going to retire to a place. If that's how I'm going to get, imagine how I'm going to get treated when I'm you know, 65 yeah. or 70. Yeah. You know, they're going to walk all over us. And I said, if that's the police, if that's the backup you get from the police here, I don't want to be here. Mm. So actually, that was the day that actually tipped it for me. And I just went, you know what, we'll just sell the houses. We'll invest back in England. And I decided not to retire there. I mean, whether, I don't know whether that's a good choice or not. <laughs> how long, how, when you woke <clears> up <throat> the next day, you're obviously thinking, right, those tyres are going to know 100 people, 50 people, 70 people. Oh, were was, you getting Paragon going through your mind again? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm going to get jumped was, again? Or? Put it this way, they were not normal. They were part of the Thai Mafia, without yeah. a doubt. I mean, because just as the police turned up, so did a Thai guy with a gun. Yeah. They'd, they'd phoned someone for proper backup. And, and, and you, you know, people get shot all the time over there. People get, I mean, they, they, they kill people all the time over there. Mm. Um, it's not a, you know... I mean, funny enough, actually, while I was out there, I got I got pulled in, um, suspected of a murder. <laughs> you got pulled in yeah, for I suspected pulled of in, murder? Yeah, suspected of murdering when someone. When was this? Um, a couple of years after that, probably. 18? Yeah, about 18 or two. Yeah, about 18, yeah. Probably tell about. me that. Tell me what happened there. Well, that was, see, because I told you I know all these Australian guys. Yeah. So we, oh, they all, you know, we used to go out to a big group of us and, and, and obviously meet more through their, their friends and whatever. So one of the clubs, we went that one night anyway, there was about a dozen of us, and we've met up with some of their mates who I didn't know. But, you know, you're all on a big crowd. It's like a big beano of guys, you know, so have a great time. And they're all good fellas. When you got to know them, they're all right. So we're in this bar. We, we, we've had a, they've, they've got photographers in all the bars. So we've had a photograph taken, and there's about 12 of us in the picture, and I'm standing behind some guy I've just met. Yeah. But I'm with a load of the others that I do know. Anyway, unbeknown to me, this, this guy was a, a hell's angel, and uh, he, was, he was kidnapped. Um, from his from his apartment um, by force, like three big guys covered in tattoos, mm. have dragged him out of his house and took him away, and he's gone. And the police were looking for him, so they they rang me up. What it was, they went to his apartment, and he's got this picture on his mantelpiece, and I'm in it. 
Full so, of tattoos. Yeah, so I'm the big guy with the tattoos. <laughs> so they went, oh, it could be him. Like, we all look the same to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so they rang, they rang me up and, uh, and they didn't speak very good English. So they talked to my wife and my, my wife said, they want you to go to the police station. I said, what about? I haven't done anything. You know, no, you're in this photograph, so they just need to rule you out. They're, they're, getting, they're dragging everyone in who's in the photo. So, okay. So we went there and I took, luckily I took my wife as an interpreter. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so we went there and got these Bangkok, top Bangkok police in there and, and, they're, and they're really, and they're, they're showing me pictures of the guy and a picture of me standing next to him. Do you know him? I went, no, I don't know. Well, you're next to him, really. Yeah. I said, yeah, but I said, I, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I know that one, that one, that one, that one. Yeah. You know, that's it. Anyway, so they went, okay, well, you, 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 I had to sign a thing. That was, that's my story and that's yeah. my statement. So he said, if you're, in, you know, if you're lying to us, you're going to be in big trouble. Anyway, so the next day they bring me up again. You got to come back down to the police station. I said, I told you I don't know him. He said, no, he's dead now. We found the body. Oh, my. So what, what it, apparently his family were quite well off and the people kidnapped him thought they could, like, ransom him or something. But they ended up torturing him and killing him. Um, and then they decided to bury him in a shallow grave outside on the field, in one of the fields somewhere. But the idiots, they, they'd, um, when they first took him, <clears throat> one of them dropped his driving license. Mm. So they got his driving mm. license. They'd hired a truck, which has got a GPS tracker in mm. it. So they, so they, actually, <clears throat> they actually managed to, in the end, they did manage to find out who it was. But when I got pulled in the second time, they were showing me a picture of this mangled up body in a hole. And they're going, do you know him? I said, listen, I didn't know him when he was alive and I don't know him now when he's dead. <laughs> you know, but I was like, you're going to be in serious trouble. Yeah. And, I was like, yeah. and you hear all these stories. So, you know, yeah. I, I was glad that my wife was there to interpret yeah. for me. God send. Um, yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a bit of a nervous moment. And it was horrible what they'd done to him. I mean, you know, apparently they'd, you know, they'd stabbed him with screwdrivers and they'd shot him or done whatever and, he, and had broken his neck. Did you, did you find out why? <clears throat> yeah, they were trying to, they wanted to ransom him to his, his family. He had money, apparently, but it, it didn't work. You know, I think he, either he put up a fight and they ended up doing him, but it all went, it all got out of control, basically. But yeah, it was, I mean, my friend, it was, he was a good friend of my mate, Nick. He mm. was a very good friend of him from Australia. And what was going through your mind? <clears throat> 2016, 2018, two big incidents happened there. That 2016 one with the Thai Mafia, mm. How long were you there for afterwards going, you know what, I'm, watching, I'm looking over my shoulder wherever I go now, it's just painful because, like you mm. said, they, 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 we all look the same, but we all think they look the same, <laughs> and it's quite hard to, to judge who's who. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it took me a while before I really relaxed from that one because, you know, they knew obviously where I lived, um, and they weren't happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's sort of after after it gets, you know, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was looking, I was locking the gates and setting the alarms and... I was I was overly cautious. Were you prepared? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in my usual way. <laughs> yeah. How easy is it to find weapons out in Thailand? I, I had one sent in pieces from America. Then I put it together when it got there. So I got a little pearl handle 20, uh, uh, 22? Yeah, 22. With subsonic hollow points. Yeah. Ready and waiting. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever have the fear of getting nicked and being in a Thailand prison? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's 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 one of your biggest fears, I think, and that's one. That, but then, you, that's that. Well, that can happen if you're stupid or you get dragged into something. It's so easy for that to happen. Mm. You know, I, got, I I was in a situation in one of the bars one night. I was out with my wife and another couple, and we was in a little a little bar. I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Cas casino, yeah, casino. It was owned by a friend of ours. So we're in this bar late night, very late night, and there's a group of Thai guys in there. They bang on, this, you know, they, they don't handle their booze very well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and they, they anyway, uh, my missus just went to the toilet. Everything was fine when she went to the toilet. When she come back, I'm standing in front of about eight Thai guys talking Thai to them, telling them to yan yan and cha cha, and da, trying to tell them to calm down because it just kicked off and they're throwing bottles at us and glasses. Why? And they they had a they, they had a go at my mate's missus, and then she's had a go at them, and then he stepped in, and next thing you know, it's like it's going to be an us and them. And my mate, the, the guy I was with there, actually, he's an interesting guy. His name's Roy, um, and he comes from Holland, and he's a he's a barrister. But he's also a kickboxer, um, and a really good one on mm. MMA. And he does he does everything. He's he's a, he's a big lad, 120 kilos, and he fights, and he's a barrister, and he's so he's, and he was like, no, let's just have it. Yeah. And I'm like, no. I said, I said, my my goal is to get us out of here in one piece, <laughs> right? Because I know this can go shit. I know yeah. we can we can might win this little battle here. We don't know who we're fighting, yeah. Yeah. right? They're rich kids from Bangkok. Yeah. They've probably got rich mums and dads. Mm. Probably connected with the old Bill. Yeah, and we're gonna get screwed. Yeah. You know, we will get fucking royally screwed. And anyway, the, the weird thing was, I, a couple of more people who knew us from the other bars were in there, and we all ended up sort of just becoming one little group. That and that we sort of we managed to back out of the place. Yeah. Um, and after we went out, it actually kicked off with this group and the security there, and the the army were actually called in because no. the police couldn't handle it. Um, and loads of them got arrested. And it was all on the news the next day. So my mate actually turned around and goes, "You, you made the right choice." Yeah. He said, "Thanks for getting me out." 
Thanks for getting me out. I said, listen, that was my only thing was just to get us out of it. Yeah, be what, safe. What are the doormen like out in Thailand? Are they British? Are they from all around Europe? What are no, they? Are they Thai doormen? Um, in if you go to Bangkok, um, some of the big clubs in Bangkok will have some what they call phalangs. Anyone who's not a Thai is called a phalang. So that you will see phalangs working in Bangkok, but I've never seen any working down in Pattaya. Yeah, um, it's all ties. Um, it's and it's because when I went out there, I thought, oh, this is. I mean, Walking Street's got like hundreds of bars and clubs, you know, mm. up here, and the security actually were pretty shit. I mean, yeah. you get the odd. The, the, I think the one bar which stood out as being quite good was run by the Navy. Mm. It was a, they had they they used to pay the Navy for their off-duty Navy guys to run it, and they were pretty naughty. Mm. They were, yeah, I mean, they, they were good in the sense that they would deal with it. Mm. But also, they'd go right over the top sometimes. They, I think they killed a couple of people out there, yeah. you know, with their actions. Um, but they get away with it because the Navy is the Navy. Yeah. And you can't, you know, you can't sort of... I wonder what it was like for you, though. A big lump, nine and a half stone, six foot three, walking down the streets of Thailand, where every, probably average art is five foot five. Yeah. You're getting clocked everywhere. There's no way of getting yeah. away. Of, you're going to get... Well, that's why I said it didn't take long for everyone yeah. to start. Yeah. Well, I know him. Yeah. <laughs> He's a big guy. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It, and like I said, and then you... You got that like attracts like thing, and then you got the the fact I don't like the bullies, and, and I don't like I don't, I don't like people being rude either. Mm. So like you know I I probably had a, I've had a few rows in bars because people the trouble with Thailand is that people go there and they assume because if you go there for like two weeks holiday and there's there's so many working girls yeah. if you go into a nightclub and there's a thousand people in there then five hundred of them are probably on the game yeah okay so. When a guy goes on holiday and he's drunk and he just he's so used to just going how much yeah right so when they see another every Thai girl to them is a hooker yeah so when my wife and I would go out it's one of the reasons we sort of stopped going out so much because you know she'd go she'd go to the toilet and some guy'd smack her on the ass or ask her how much she wanted oh, or mate. and she'd and she you know, she would politely say no I'm with my husband or yeah. you know but then they go I don't give a shit about him you know so I end up punching someone's head in um and, and, it, and it happened so often. You know, so it, it sort of ruins your night out. How, really. how would you personally deal with that? Your wife's <laughs> going to the toilet, you're clocking, you clock everything, you see everything's going mm. on anyway, like naturally, bam, bam, mm. bam, bam, bam. How do you deal with it knowing that there's a group of four lads over there, a couple of footballers from fans, football fans over there, you know something's going to happen? Well, if if they are, if I mean, look, they're going to try probably, but if they, it depends on the level of what they do. If a guy sort of went, oh, can I buy you a drink now? Or, or come and talk to us. And she went, no, I'm with me fella. And I go, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I'm done, yeah. is that? You know, but if you if, if your missus says to someone, I'm with my husband, he's over there. Yeah. And they go, look at you and go, nah, I don't give a shit, yeah. I don't give a shit about him. Yeah. <laughs> come here, darling, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they do half the time, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I've, I've, I've knocked out quite a lot of people in Thailand as well. And you got to Thailand for quite a life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the mad thing about it, you know. <laughs> I'm not saying it happened all the time, but it did happen a lot. Yeah. It did happen a lot. And, I, and I'll be honest, you know, my missus is one of those. She's not, she's, she, she was a, she's a good looking girl, but she'd never, she's not flirty. She's yeah. not tarty. She doesn't play up to the guys. Yeah. She will just, you know, even that's, that's why in the end she, she, she takes someone with her to go to the toilet or she'd ask me to take her to the toilet or, because yeah. it just depends on how busy the night was and what sort of arsehole mm. we're in. It, it can just get all. all did you ever there. visit any prisons in Thailand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they're not very nice. You don't want to stay there. No, okay. Um, yeah, my friend who got, my friend who got the seven months remand, I tried to help him out because it, it was just, it was just so wrong. He's a nice guy. Um, and he wasn't a dealer or anything, mm. but that's, they were making out, they made out in the papers. They put like a, pile of cocaine about this big like in front of a picture of him mm. and it was actually like 0.7 yeah, 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 of a gram yeah. or something um and he used to have parties at his house i mean that's that's what it was someone who'd been to one of his parties at his house they got nicked yeah. and they decided to sort of say oh he's you know he's a dealer yeah and then I, and then they went in and set him up and and that, that was going to buy their freedom by setting up a big coke dealer but he yeah. weren't a big coke dealer yeah. he was just a really nice guy mm. Yeah. So tell me the difference between visiting a UK prison, oh, which we know about, versus just, a Thai prison. It's just horrible. I mean, I never got to see the the proper inside of a prison, um, but I've been told by many people what it's like. Um, but the just the, just the visiting is horrible. Yeah. You know, you <clears throat> you have to wear you have to wear certain clothes. You can't go in like a vest or whatever, and um, you've got to be dressed politely, as they put it. You have to get a visiting thing. You have to wait outside to be called. And then you go into, you've got like a, a sort of double screen and you get like a little thing like this. You can pick the phone up and, you know, but the, you can see that, the, I mean, you, everything in there, you need to give people money in there to survive because they will, the sort of food they'll feed you is like leftover slops. Yeah. You know, they'll throw like fish heads in the middle of the room and pick your way through that. You know, it might be, might be 40 of you in a room and a shit hole in the corner, shitter in the, in the middle of it or something. You know, it's, it's not nice. It's, mm. um, 
a lot of people don't. I mean, if you get a long term prison sentence, it's unlikely you'll survive it. To yeah. be honest, put it this way: I think the way I think the British government still do it, where if you anyone who's anyone from here has been banged up over there, if you do one year, it counts as two here. Right. You know, it's like it's, they, they double it. Um, they should probably treble it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's just horrible and not something you want to do. Mm. I want to go back to that 2016 tear up you had mm -hmm. with the sorry 2018 with the ties. How did that defuse itself? Because you could defuse it with the Australians. How well, can you defuse it with the Tigers? Yeah, or were you like, just get me home now? No, I just, I just, I mean, I'm just obviously wanted to get out of there. But, but, um, but, but what I found out was that I, I, I did see a couple of them bombing about on their bikes and things. One of them was a taxi driver, um, <clears throat> and they, uh, and they lived not far from me. They were like in the next main soy across. So, you know, um, so I, I, I did keep an eye. I, I didn't know all of them. Didn't know all the faces. But I, I thought if they were going to do something, they'd probably do it fairly quickly. Yeah. And so, and I, and I, because I'm in and out of Thailand, so I was there for a couple more weeks, and then I was probably gone for a month or two, and then back. So it's sort of, I suppose they just sort of, it just died down. Yeah. And only one of the guys, only one of the guys got really hurt, who, who, who Nick hit, and uh, and he probably took a share of that fifty thousand baht anyway. Right. Okay. So they'd already, you can bet your life, they'd already done a deal with the police mm. over how much they were going to get mm. or something. And what about back in England? What was it like back in England when you're off guard? Walking around the streets with your kids or whatever. Have you ever been attacked or anyone jumped you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't happen often, but when it does, I mean, generally, like I said, like, generally, I don't mind working in my hometown because I've, I've got nothing to be feel bad about. Mm. If I've done my job as a, if I've been fair with people on the door, I've not been funny. Like, I've smacked a lot of people, but everyone I've smacked, I, I in my mind deserved it, yeah. and I didn't go over the top with ninety nine point nine percent of them. Yeah. But anyway, one day. One day, yeah, I was with my, it was a long time ago, I was with my boy, my boy was four, so he's 41 now, so it's a long time okay, ago. Okay, so we're talking 90s here. Yeah, so so I'm a, I'm a pretty young, pretty pretty well-known doorman, and I'm, and I'm yeah, I'm pretty hot-headed as well then. But I, was, I wasn't the head doorman at the, at the club in, uh, I used to work then at uh, Frank's Nightclub, but I wasn't the head doorman. It was a guy called Golden Chambers, who, bless him, he's not here any, anymore. But he was a real tough head doorman anyway. So these guys come in one night, they're barred, four of them. Barred because they always cause trouble. And I didn't want to let them in. That's my, my I wouldn't have let them in. But they, they talked their way to, they, they sweet talked the head doorman, the head doorman went, oh, I'll give him a chance. You know, you know. And uh, so I said, you're making a wrong, making a wrong move. I know they're going to kick off. They will. Mm. They won't do anything else. Anyway, so I pulled one of them on the way and I went, listen, you know, I'm, I'm fed up throwing you like out. I said, no, I wouldn't let you in. I said, you play up tonight. I said, no, no, I'm going to throw you out mm. pretty tough, pretty mm. hard. You know, I'm not just mm. going to throw you out. I'm going to put you out nicely. I'm going to put you out. Mm. And they were in there five minutes. Kicked it off straight away with some other guy. And and it's just and they, they they all fight they're all fighting probably full on hundred you know, percent fighting not not just resisting so we've had to drag them out you know screaming and kicking and I you know bumped one of them into the doorway on the way out and uh, anyway and they sort of, they they got put out quite quite they weren't battered but they got put out quite hard but then they got outside all four of them and they weren't happy they wanted to they wanted to have a rematch so they they wanted to come back at the front door <clears throat> and I used to work with a massive massive black guy then called Guy he was huge and he said to me he used to moan about why I, why I got paid more money than he did, and I said, Guy, I'll show you why I get paid more money. <laughs> so they, they, these these four are threatening me. I said, and I, one of the things when I was a young doorman, I was terrible for. Um, if people said they were going to come back and do this and do that, I said, well, do it now then, and I'd be straight out there. Yeah. And, and it's wrong because I should just let it diffuse. But I was short. I was a bit short tempered, so when someone made a threat to me, <clears throat> I would just go for it. So I've walked out with four of them on my own, and I and I just I dropped the first three and I chased the other one away. He didn't want to know. So three of them, I think two out of the three had to go to hospital. Um, they weren't very happy about it all. They got they all jumped in a black cab and went to the hospital. Anyway, so a week or two later, I'm with my boy. I'm in Ramsgate. It's Sunday. I said I only had my son on Sundays then, and we used to go to the local video shop as you could in them days to get a film. Mm. So we've gone as we're walking into the shop. <laughs> okay, looking, I saw this bunch of guys coming down the road. I thought oh, it looks like them fellas, and they all had shooting gear on. They'd all been out doing with the shotgun and shells and. Mm. I thought, I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do anything stupid in the daytime, surely, in a public place, you know. So I've gone in there, chose a film, and as I'm walking out of the shop, I get this shotgun shoved in my face. Um, now, the guy's actually, he hasn't taken it out of the case. He's got his arm in the case, but his finger's on the trigger. Mm. And he's just shoved the muzzle the end under my chin. And he went, yeah, what do you think of that then? What do you think of that? He said, we've got to save yourself now. And uh, he said, not so tough now, are you? I said, mate, I mean, listen... Why don't you put the gun down? I said, I'll batter all four of you again like I did level a week. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I said, I've got my kid with me. You know, I've got my boy with me. Anyway, the guy in the shop saw what was happening. So the guy came out and, and took my son back in the shop and went and phoned the police. 
I'm still arguing with him. I still got this gun, and I'm going. I said, "Look, I said you're going to do it. Do it." I said, "I didn't know what to say." Yeah. I mean, what do you do? You know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a gun put in your face, but you know, you don't want your last words to be, "Oh, don't shoot me." Yeah, yeah you might as well. <laughs> you know, yeah, you might as well get yeah. your head blown off yeah. being brave. You know. <laughs> so I went. I went. Yeah, wait, could I said, "You haven't got the balls to pull the trigger anyway." And that's what I said to him. Oh, I went, "Go on, then do it. Pull it. Go on." I said, "You wouldn't. You ain't got the balls." Right. Anyway, at that point, we heard the police thing coming. Right, the siren. So. um Anyway, the guy with the guns just ran off. And the, the police got there and the police come up to me and, and I got my boy and they said, oh, do you want to make a complaint? I went, no. I said, the guy with the gun's gone anyway. You missed him. I said, I'll sort it out myself. So anyway, my, my, my friends I work with, they weren't very happy about it either. They, you know, like, and a, sort of like an a, a, a attack with a kid and all that. Yeah. So um, well, these guys all used to drink in Ramsgate and there was a bar there. We Because we used to work like Thursday, Friday, Saturday but mm. at that time. But Mondays we had off, and Monday there was a bar in Ramsgate that used to have cheap drinks night, and it would be like a thousand people in there. So we went, we'll went, go and find them on the Monday. It's not, it was not one of my doors, and it was, I think it might have even been, before, yeah, it might have been before I'd done the door agency. Mm-hmm. But anyway, around about that sort of time. So I've gone there, uh, and I had a couple of doormen with me, so Big Lloyd and another guy, and we've gone in there, and we, Todd's law, we couldn't find them. We went in the following week, still couldn't find them. So anyway, didn't, they didn't bother looking at it. So the next one I went down on my own. <laughs> They're all there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so. I'm in there. I was in there really early to see if they were there, and I saw them all walking. So four of them, and uh, I thought, right, no, sorry, three, three out of the four. That's right. So three of them are coming, and I thought, right, how can I get them outside? I don't want to be fighting in the club because yeah. I, I respect the doorman. Yeah. I don't want to cause a problem anywhere. So uh, anyway, I, I just walked over to them. <laughs> I went, all right, dickheads, <laughs> and I carried on walking. And they were like, uh, uh, I didn't know what to do. So they, they followed me. So I've gone out to the front door, and I said to the doorman, look, I said. Um, I said, there's going to be three guys come through in a minute. I said, I'm going to do my best to take this right outside. I said, but if not, it might have to happen here. And then I like, well, please don't do it here, Marcus. You know? So anyway, these guys come out and one of them's got a pint glass in his hand. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing in our manor? You know, I think they're from London or something. You know? <laughs> I went, uh, I said, mate, I said, uh, well, let me put it like this. I said, you haven't got your gun today. I said, no, I ain't got my little boy. I said, yeah, I'll come here for you. Right? And uh, and there was this one sort of standing there, one in, little one in front of me and a nasty one here. And... So I thought this one was the biggest problem. So I hit him first with the right, straight in the chops, knocked him out. I then brought my elbow back and smashed that one in the jaw and done his jaw. And the other one, I just grabbed him with both hands, picked him off the ground, slammed him on the floor and stamped on him. And by that time, all the doormen in the reception have just now jumped oh, on me to stop it. But yeah, my point was proven. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and do you know what? They never, ever even looked at me funny again. I never had a problem with them again. Yeah. You know, if they, if they saw me walking down the street, they'd cross over. Um, do but, you still? So you were at thirty years old there, roughly. Were you? Mm. What, did you see him for many years? Yeah, yeah. Was it? Now. Was it? Was, you still see him now? <laughs> is it a clock? Remember? Is it a forgotten? Is it a nod? After that, they never. They had more respect. They never. They never came back at me with anything. They never caused a problem with me ever again. None, none of them. Isn't, but, it, isn't it amazing? Like all the amount of tear ups you've had and fights and incidents, <clears> and <throat> you've never been banged up. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's <laughs> like literally unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Um, why yeah. do you think? Why do you think that is? I, I don't know. I, I like to think. Well, I mean, the trouble is in the in the later years, whether people were in the wrong or, or not, they, they they still want to get you nicked. More, you know, in the old, if you go back to the early years, I think people had a little bit of a sort of decency about like you and me to have a scrap and yeah. sort it out. Yeah. Um, because I know that you know I've had many scraps on people on the doors and I didn't get them nicked for it. Mm. You know, I got a few bruises. I got black eye. I got blast. I got well, they, they didn't get nicked. Mm. Um, so you sort of just dealt with it. You, you, I don't know. I think back then people sort of dealt with it more their own way. Mm. You know, you, you lost, you lost, you won, you won. Mm. And sometimes, you, sometimes I made some. I made some of my best friends, like the ones in Australia, in, uh, in Thailand. Yeah, yeah. You know, end up being actual mates of mine. I had a massive tear up with them to start with. Mm. You know, because like I said, put yourself in their their point of view. They didn't actually want to, that, those. All that the, only one guy was out of order. The yeah. other guys were were actually. Just, but roles reverse. Someone phoned you, and you yeah, your mates have been the same I'd thing. Probably done exactly yeah. the same thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, when on the doors, how many, how many times have people who you've chucked out have gone, I want to come back and shoot you? All the time. Was that a thing that people would use all the time? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's why I said that's my pet hate because that's why I normally, that was the one thing that was like a red flag to me when I was young. Uh, when someone when you say, say like, you were young, you're talking in your 30s and 40s. Yeah, when well, did that I'd when, say I'd say I'd, I know, I'd say I definitely calmed down by the time I got to 40. I'd sort of calmed down a lot. Yeah. But definitely when I was in my 20s trying to make a name for myself and when I was in my 30s I was probably my most dangerous. Yeah. Because I was I was a bit I was a bit like you know, I didn't always think of the best way to deal with yeah, something. Yeah. I, mean, and I, I used to hate people saying, oh, I'm going to do this to yeah. you. I'm going to do it now then. Yeah. You know, why, why wait till next week? You're yeah. going to come back and beat me up. Let's do it. Yeah. 
you know, and then I'd normally go out and knock them out. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so many of them ended like that. But uh, why do you think people would want to have a tear out of you? Nine and a half stone, 21 to 22 inch arms, six foot three drugs. white, <laughs> alcohol drugs. Okay. And then there's always the other thing. I mean, a lot of the people we were fighting with also didn't know me. You know, when, when you're working in this, I mean, for instance, I remember one of them. He was a, he was a Millwall bushwhacker. Okay. And it sticks in my head because. Remember his name? No, I don't. No, I never no. asked his name. No. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> He was, but he, he was really, he was, he was, he was horrible. He, he'd been in, I think, he came in, and, like I said, we used to get all the coach parties down. So, you know, some of them were great. Some yeah. of the coach parties were just nice people. Some people were nice in the daytime, but as the day went on and they got more drunk, then they turned into idiots. And and so we didn't want to, we didn't mind letting them in in the, in the lunch times because they were all amongst themselves, mm-hmm. but we didn't, uh, we didn't, sorry. We didn't want to, um, didn't really want them back in the evening because it ruins the local yeah. balance of men and girls and you know plus if you're 50, 50 guys kick off you know you've got your work cut yeah, out you know yeah, what I mean yeah. that's a major that's a major scrap mm. so yeah so we uh, I mean there's this guy was funny he was a, he was a big lump um, and he was like he was so insistent what he was gonna I'm coming in you know stopping me blah 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 I went mate you can't get you got to get past me I'll get I'll go right through you and he did he just attacked me he's like, with a massive right and he was like feet, <laughs> feet up in the air bosh out cold. <laughs> And one of his mates went, do you know who that is? He's a Millwall bushwhacker. I said, well, he's been whacked, hasn't he? <laughs> cool, listen, do you find, do you find then once you've done that, you think, oh, here we go again. There's got to be 50 Millwall fans coming around the corner well, again and you're prepared. You, and... Yeah, that's why you don't want to do that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You don't really want to do that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I can remember one, one instance sticks in my mind. I stopped a major instant once. I was such a simple thing. This is where, this is where a, less, a less experienced dorm might make the mistake. So we used to have these lunchtime sessions and you get five, we used to get five or 600 geezers in there, in coach parties, you know, dark room, rave music on. They're obviously charged yeah, up, yeah. whatever. And um, anyway, this, uh, this uh, when the lights come up, I think it was, I can't remember, was it four or five o'clock, something like that. You, you got, like, you've got to close it. You've got to shut it down, get them out, yeah. and then you've got to be reopened for the evening. Anyway, so the glass lectures are a bit anxious to get going, you know, they're, so they're, they're running around picking up. Anyway, two guys, I see two guys at the bar giving the barman a bit of stick. So we're running over there. I said, what's, what's up, fellas? What's up? He went, I had bought two bottles of Budweiser just five minutes ago, and that twat's nicked them. Right? And the guys right, weren't me. I didn't. Yeah. So they're arguing. And, 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 and I know these guys, they're all right. They've been all right all, all lunchtime. They haven't played up. But they're part of a massive group. Yeah, there's probably 70 of them or something mm. in there. And then all of a sudden, because they're shouting, all their mates are like, what's going on over here? And I said, all of a sudden, there's more coming and more coming. I went to the bar and went, give me two bottles of Budweiser out of the fridge. Uh, he went, what? I said, give me two bottles of Budweiser. And he goes, guys, well, sorry about that. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Please enjoy them on me. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Thank yeah. you very much. Oh, it's all right. Yeah. It's all diffused. Yeah, perfect. So, two bottles of Bud yeah. or a bloody riot. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. What was your relationship like with the old Bill over the years in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s? Yeah, not great, really. I, I tried. I did try very hard to get on with them. I say that, but I suppose in, in hindsight, I probably wound them up a little bit as well, really. Um, because, like you said, I was involved in so many fights. So they must have got a lot of people going, you know, he hit me, he knocked me out, he yeah. done this, he done that. But without without witnesses and without CCTV or whatever, then they would. So they did try very, very hard to make cases against me on many, many occasions mm-hmm. and sort of pretty much generally failed. Um, but yeah, I can I can think of some funny some funny things that did happen. Um, we worked at Bankology once, uh, a Bankology weekend. So it's like, and in those days, the Sunday was probably one of the best days. Yeah. I mean, nowadays it's dead. Yeah. But in those days, it'd start on Friday, and a massive Friday, a massive so, all day Saturday, right. all day yeah. Sunday, and then, you know, and then finish. And then Monday would be like a normal, sort of normal day, although it's a bank holiday. So we've, we've been working all weekend. And um, anyway, I'd taken, I'd got a new, new motorbike and uh, I wanted to show the guys at work. I wanted to like show the boys, you know. So my missus went, don't you drink? And I went, no, no, I won't, I'll be all right. And so I've gone to work with this brand new ZL1000 thing I've got, Kawasaki. Parked it out the back of the pub. I all, me, all, me, all the doorman, all the managers, everyone, oh, lovely, yeah. nice bike. Anyway, so we worked that night. And at the end of the night, we had a, like we call it a lock-in. Mm. So, you know, we've we worked all weekend. We deserve a little bit of a downtime for the guys. And anyway, so we were having a drink and it was getting a bit late. And I was supposed to be, I had a girlfriend at the time, not a wife. I had a girlfriend and I was supposed to be home and I was well late. So anyway, I thought, oh, I'd better go I'll ring a taxi. So I've rung for a taxi, and they went, that's like an hour's wait. I thought, oh, jeez, I'm going to be even late. I'm going to get right rollicking. I thought, it's Monday morning. There's no one about. You know what I mean? So I, thought, I, said, to the, I said to the manager, can I have my crash helmet? He went, no, you can't. If you're not taking a bike in your state, yeah. right? I went, come on. So I suddenly up a few miles. You know, I'm not giving you a crash helmet. I went, all right. So I thought, I've got my key in my pocket. So I've slipped out. I know. So I slipped out. I'm going to go anyway without a crash helmet. And then they sent Big Lloyd out to stop me. 
So I'm out in this backyard trying to get my bike out, and then all of a sudden there's this silhouette of like the monster standing there, and he went, you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I went, Lloyd, get out of the way. I went, I'm going home. I will give me a lift then. <laughs> so what right? I, Call I went, all right. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. So anyway, so, I've, so he's jumped on the back of my bike. And I think Lloyd was about 22 stone then. He was massive. So it's now turned into like a chopper. It's like that, you know. It's like the front end's up here. <laughs> and he, and, he's, and he's, he's like, it's, it's this great big thing on the back of my bike. And, we're, and with no helmets. And it's now four o'clock in the morning. So we didn't expect to see anyone. So we drive down the first road, we get to like North Down Road, and then we go down to where there's a, a, a Dane Valley Park, and there's like a road going all around Dane Valley Park. And when we get to Dane Valley Park, all of a sudden there's a blue light, bosh, there's a police car. Oh, no. And he's gone, shit, pull over, pull over. I went, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> so I'm off, I'm like, I'm running. But the bike, he's, he's turning around on the back to try and look, see what's going on. So the bike's all over the place like this, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to control. Anyway, being like four o'clock in the morning as well, it was it was like it was quite sort of dewy and wet. And then, anyway, so uh, he's he's shouting in my ear. I was going, turn into the park. They won't be able to follow us, right? So we turned into this uh, park, and uh, he went, turn your lights off. So I turned my lights off. I can't see anything. <laughs> so I, I can't see the trees. I'm driving through a park, but the police car's behind me with the blue lights. He's coming in the park. He's chasing me still. So we, we're sort of picking our way through this this park, and it's got like tarmac paths and grass bits and anyway I've gone to sort of try and change direction because I know there's an entrance and I'll get out that end but I've lost it on the wet grass so the the, the back wheel's gone um, and my mate slid off into the bushes I've got my leg stuck under the bike so I'm sort of like being dragged along by the bike like sliding along by the time I've stopped and I've managed to get this bike up, like I say it's a thousand cc bike, so it's quite heavy. I've got it up. I'm just about to go again, and all of a sudden this, this policeman has just appeared and grabbed hold of my handlebars and went, "You're nicked." <laughs> so I stepped off the bike and I dropped the bike on him, right? And I just threw the bike on him and it flattened him, and I ran out of the park. And he really wasn't happy, right? So he's <laughs> he's running after me. I can't run very well. I, I've always had a, I had a broken leg from yeah. years ago, so. I'm hobbling out of the park and, I, and I've got outside and there's like a five foot high wall and I've just dived over this wall into some bushes and hid, which seemed like a good idea at the time. But anyway, this this, this cop was running behind me going, I'm going to get you and I'll get you, I'm going to give it to you. And he, he didn't know who I was. Right? He had no idea who he was chasing. Um, and anyway, but I thought he'd perhaps he'd just you know, go, but he didn't. You know, I hear him radioing. The next thing you know, a dog van's turned up and then another car. And, oh, and there's about five patrol vehicles yeah. turned up in the end and they're everywhere. And I'm still under the bush. I'm curled up under this bush. Anyway, so one side of this wall is like five foot high, and on the I've dived over it. On the other side, it's only a two foot drop. Mm. Right, so you're you're basically on a little ledge under a bush. So anyway, they started going through with this police dog, and and the first time it's actually gone past me. I thought well, the result, right? It might it might just fuck off. They didn't. <laughs> like, anyway, Barney the police dog it was right. Yeah. So Barney comes back and sniffs me out, and all of a sudden I've got a torch in my face, and they went, "Don't move, don't move, or we'll take the dog on you." Well, when you're curled up under a bush, right, in a ball, you feel a bit silly for starters. But we go, oh, you got me. <laughs> right? So all I wanted to do was actually stand up. So I moved. So I, I got up onto my knees, right? And he set the dog on me. So this dog's come flying in and he's grabbed hold of this arm with his teeth. And he's, like, that's right. So I thought, shit. So now even more, I want to get up, you know, properly. So I've, I've stood up and I've still got a dog attached to me. And then this other policeman's uh, grabbed hold of the other arm, right? So I'm like, I've got a policeman on one arm and a dog on the other. And I'm now standing but I'm standing on the higher ground, looking down over the five foot drop. So anyway, I managed to somehow pick Barney up with one hand and I threw him over the wall, right? And once I threw him over the wall, he bit a policeman the other side. He attacked a copper, yeah. bit his ass and ripped his trousers. And then this other copper, I went, get off of me. And I, and I threw him over the wall as well. So I've got rid of both of them now. And I thought, oh, no, but I'm oh, sorry, I, I, I neglected to say, while, they were, while he was biting me and he was holding yeah. me, when I was still on my knees, yeah. Another policeman's run over to it with a, one of them big metal torches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's leaned over the top of the wall and he's pounded me straight over the head with it. Not once, but seven times, right? Because I was on my knees at that yeah. point where they set the dog on me and all of a sudden, bang, bang. And I was like, Jesus. And it, I, don't know, I don't know how it didn't knock me out. But anyway, it split the shit out of my head. And, um, and I was like a fountain of blood coming out of my head. And that's why I went absolutely crazy, threw the dog over the wall, threw the cop over the wall. And this got, then once I stood up, because I was on higher ground, he couldn't hit me on the head. Yeah. Yeah. But and at that point, there was one sneaking through behind behind me with handcuffs. And I went, if you come near me, I'm going to break your jaw as well. I went, listen, you want to get in the police car? I went, that's fine. And they went, it's Marcus, it's Marcus. Oh, right? no. So they're sort of like, they went, once I stood up, they've gone, and there's a fountain of blood coming out of my head. And uh, anyway, so they, they literally all stood back. 
they opened the police car up and they had like the bubble thing in the back. Yeah. So I climbed over the wall, got in it, and I'm pissing blood everywhere. They took me to the police station and they and they breathalyzed me and I passed. <laughs> uh, I got an amber light. Um, and so then they, uh, they had to get a surgeon in to stitch me head up. Uh, I needed, I don't know, loads and loads of stitches in. It was right mess. I didn't, didn't stop bleeding for 24 hours, even after they stitched it. And, um, and then they charged me with, uh, what was it? They charged me with um, speeding, uh, reckless driving, dangerous driving, uh, failing to stop, um, ABH on a police officer, oh, and, was, and like, no crash helmet, and there was a whole list of oh, charges mate. like this. And uh, I went not guilty. <laughs> and the thing was, when it all went to court, because I went back there and took photographs um, of where it, where everything happened and how it happened. I was I was my only witness, if you like, yeah. so there was no one on my side. But one policeman who was there actually told the truth about the whole incident. He told about where the guy leaned over and smashed me over the head yeah. several times. So um, he grasped the other cop. Yeah, up. yeah. And he actually got moved away out of the area for telling the truth. Yeah, okay. So because um, other than that, if he'd have, if he'd have kept them, yeah, I'd have been in real trouble. <clears throat> My lawyer in the end said, look, it was duplicity of law. Where the um, dangerous driving and reckless driving, that's called duplicity of law. You can't be done for murder and manslaughter. Yeah. It's one or the other. Yeah. So that got thrown out. The speeding, uh, speedo wasn't calibrated. That got thrown out. Uh, dangerous driving, thrown out. Um, ABH on the police officer was dropped. Why was that bit dropped? I don't know. I honestly can't remember. Um because I'm sure that's the bit where they all be old on a minute. You can get rid of all those ones, but definitely not that. I think it was basically because they were attacking me and I was chucking them off. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, the damage to my head was pretty obvious. But the, the police officer who hit me on the head with a torch said that he aimed a blow at my shoulder mm. and I lunged forwards. Mm. I didn't lunge forward seven times, did I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but anyway, so I, 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 like I said, I suppose over the years... Oh, sorry, I haven't finished the story. So anyway, <laughs> I'm in the police station. And Lloyd, as the one who was on the back, he ran off through the bushes, right? So he managed to go back to the pub we've come from. Got back there without getting nicked. And he, and he rang the police station up, of all things to do. And I went, who's that? He, went, he said, have you got Marcus Redwood in there? He, he said, yeah, we have. We questioned him. He said, you ain't got me. I was on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so when Lloyd said, <laughs> And they went, and they come in, they went to me. Who's on the back? I went, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just picked him up on the way. Yeah. So, yeah, but it was, it, I mean, it, it's funny now when you look back at it. It didn't seem so funny at the time. But like I said, I've probably, I've probably pissed them off. I probably did upset them a few times with silly, silly stunts like that. Um, I mean, again, actually, the, 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 the policeman who chased me through the, through the, um, the Dane Valley, who was going to, you know, going to, wanted to get me, he's actually really nice to me now. <laughs> so you're still clocking these old Bill round 10? <coughs> yeah, some of them. I mean, yeah, a lot of them okay. retired now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of them, a lot of them that did get to know me, I think actually I did get on quite well with quite a few of them. But there was a certain hierarchy that didn't actually want the police to have anything to do with me at all because mm. they they still suspected me of this higher involvement with you know some sort of organised crime. Or yeah, something, yeah. Which which I wasn't. And crime wasn't your thing. No, no, not at all. When did your profile rise to a level where the local <coughs> police of Kent were like, he's into something else? Um, was it the, was it the crazy funeral? That that certainly tipped it. The, the, the being shot at outside my house really put the spotlight on me and then it wasn't Hold long on. we haven't spoken about being shot outside your house yeah yeah shot outside shot at outside my house we did that last on week. the last on episode the last that's project. right yeah yeah yeah. that was in 1990 yeah. so then by the time the craze funeral was in i think 91 91 or two. 92 yeah. i think so that wasn't long after that so they're already looking at me and then all of a sudden boom i'm there and i was the thing was i was i was, I was such a larger than life character and i was on the front page of every newspaper yeah. i was on everyone's tv yeah and um and probably the worst thing I did also was I had this lighter, which was actually like a gun. Yeah. And I had that in my end. So whilst I was doing the security on the, I'm lighting my cigarette, <laughs> but but they were actually taking, they were filming it yeah. like it was a gun. Yeah. And like, look at these like, you know, underworld people. And, yeah. I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, so I'm walking along with a gun in my end yeah. in the crazed funeral. Yeah. But it was a lighter. Yeah. But anyway, that got me in all sorts of trouble. So, um, yeah, so next thing you know, yeah, I, I was I was getting my doors kicked in quite regular. Mm. Not very nice. Not very nice. No. Tell me about the Crow's funeral. What did you? What was your actual involvement in the funeral? Only really as a security. That's it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was. I've been friends with Dave for a while. Dave was trying to drum up as many people as possible because it did take. I can't remember how many people, but a hell of a lot. And and so, I think just about every doorman in London came out and got yeah. involved in that, and a load of other people who weren't doorman as well. Mm. But um, and then there was someone tried to break into the um, funeral parlour. To, I don't know why they were trying to break in. They were going to desecrate the body or do something horrible. Reggie Craig. <coughs> Reg, Reggie Craig. 
Uh, not Reggie's, uh, Ronnie's. Ronnie's, yeah, sorry. Ronnie's. Yeah. So they end up having to put because it wasn't for a while. They had to put like an overnight security. Yeah. So I did that. I did that a couple of nights as well. So I helped out. And and while we were doing that, we had to let certain people in to pay their respects. So we had to go and open the coffin up and show them it and you know, show him him. Sorry. Yeah. And um and make sure it was just done properly. And then they would leave and. And what was that feeling like for you, seeing <clears> opening a <throat> coffin and seeing Ronnie Cray that you're looking after, and that's probably someone, you know, yeah. in, in the years of growing up, yeah. everyone's talking about the Crays. It was very surreal. I yeah. mean, it was very surreal. It was like, you know, and, and also when you, I mean, obviously you don't get the same feeling when you're looking at, a, you know, and basically it's a little old man in a box, yeah. you know, but in his day, oof, you know, he had, <laughs> he had big footprints, you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah, it commanded a lot of respect. So it was very, 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 very weird for me being involved in that. Um I suppose it was like a bit of an honour, really, to sort mm. of like to be involved with it, you know. And did it kick off at all? Like you got you got fellas coming down from Manchester, Birmingham, London. Or was there was there a big respect thing for that day? I think it was a big respect thing for that day. Yeah. I never saw, I never actually saw or experienced anything go wrong that day. Everyone, mm. I mean, there was a hell of a lot of naughty people on the streets, um, you know. And 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 actually, I made quite a lot of new friends from then, you know. And and to this day, they're still my friends as well. Mm. So you only had probably only a handful, but but a handful of good guys that I sort of liked and I met. Yeah. So after that, that was all over the press, the papers, Sky <clears throat> Sky TV, BBC, da da da. Your face was being involved with that. What was the feeling like for you when you went back to your hometown? Did the profile rise raise up again? Did you feel like people were on you? Yeah, I did. It was. Um, I mean, it, it helped me in some ways. Like I said, because it, you know, it sort of put a bit of mystery behind me. Mm. So people were like, oh, you know, don't want to mess with him because yeah. you know he's got this, he's got backup, right? Yeah. So that was good. It, it made my job a lot easier <laughs> in some ways, but then it didn't make it easier. It didn't make my life any easier where the police were concerned. Mm. So, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it did make, and also I got, I probably got more, probably got more work from it, you know, because the sort of the name was getting bigger, the company's name was getting bigger. Yeah. He runs Mark One, you know, the, if you've got a problem, he'll sort it out, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I, I still had problems. I still got, you still get problems. You still get problem people mm. and problem bars. <laughs> do you feel now you've hit sixty that you're ready to properly slow down? With yeah. Or do you, or, no, I, have, yeah. I have properly slowed down. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I, my, all I want to do really now is I want to enjoy. I want to enjoy what time I've got left, and I want to. And I, I just want to. I want to be as healthy as I can. Yeah. So yeah, my attitudes changed a hell of a lot. Um, and, and obviously it's. I don't get involved in those sort of things anymore. I do my best. I mean, I, I still get phone calls. I still get yeah. people ringing me up and think I can solve every problem. Yeah. I had a guy send me a text the other day. Oh, I got beaten up at a club in Canterbury. The doormen are assholes. You know, what can you do about it? Well, nothing actually, mate. Yeah, <laughs> they don't yeah, work for me. <laughs> they don't work for me. And I'll retire. Yeah. But, but you know, if I if if I can, if I if if I feel like it's someone's done something unjust, and I've still got a bit of few contacts and a bit of clout, then I would make a phone call if it's yeah. someone I know or something. I'd, I'd try and. If I could find a peaceful resolution to something, I would as well. How, you know. would, how would you describe your <clears throat> career from your working the doors in your twenties, your thirties, your forties, and your fifties? Start with the twenties. How would I explain? How, would how I, do you explain you as a mm. doorman? Because obviously, like any businessman, well, we get better and better as we get older yeah. and wiser, etc. Well, you should do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you should do. I mean, you know, repetition's the mother of skill and all that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose in my twenties, I was trying to find my feet. I didn't really know where it was headed. Um, certainly didn't have a big plan of what I was going to do. Um, but then by the time I got to like 28, I think was when I started the business, I think I was 28, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. About 28, 1990. Um, by then I sort of found a direction. Um, then I sort of plodded on for 10 years and I was, I was thinking, I wasn't thinking big. I was mm. thinking, you know, just want to make a good living. So <clears throat> that's what I was doing. And it was, it was, you know, largely, Largely confined to my sort of area, a few little trips out to other places. But then when I started the agency, like I said, about when I was about 28, then then it all just started to take off, really. And it all just it changed completely. Um, you know, so all of a sudden you're you have to go to other areas where you'd not known. Mm -hmm. And you, you you sort of you sort of got like I said, you, you, you're trying to build a reputation to make life a bit easier for yourself because you don't want to have to keep. You don't want to have to keep fighting everybody. Yeah. You don't want to have to keep fighting every tough guy in the town. You don't want to have to keep, you know, it's much easier when you can go, look, just, you can't come in. And yeah. they go, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, I, I, I think so from, yes, yeah, so, so from sort of 30 to 40 was when I sort of made that reputation, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. And how were you personally as a doorman in your 30s compared to your 40s? A lot better, I think. But, um, well, you, I'm, you, not, you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was, I was, I'm sorry, sorry, not better. Yeah. I was, I was, the younger I was, 
probably the shorter temper I was and, yeah. the, and the less experience I'd had. Yeah. So as you get older and you learn, you do make mistakes. Um, and I, I don't think there's any doorman who could say he's never made a mistake. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But hopefully if you're, a, you're an half decent person then you learn from it and you try not to make the same mistake again mm. or you see easier ways that things or something could be dealt with. Mm. You know, like I said, like like I mean, one of the one of the first doormen I ever worked with was an old guy called Elwin, and <clears throat> he wasn't the toughest doorman in Margate, but he managed to work that Ace of Clubs, which was a rough place, because he he had a gift of the gab, and he also knew how to treat people. And he, I did learn quite a bit from him, so I did pick up quite a bit from him. There was another guy uh, called Johnny Andrews who's who's still around, and John is um, John was my hero. John yeah. was like. John had done 12 years on the door. And I, that, to me, that was like, that was forever. I was like, well, you're in your second year. And so yeah. I've done 12 years. Yeah. Oh, you know. yeah. So, but John used to work, a, I mean, in the very old days where it was only him mm. in a pub and a nightclub. Mm. No one else. No backup. One guy. And it was a troublesome place in those days. But you know why no one messed with him? Because he wouldn't, if you took liberty with him on the night, He'd be on your doorstep the next day. Yeah. He'd find where you live and he would drag you out and bat you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would deal with it. And, and so once that happened a few times, everyone knew the score. And, he, and no one, I don't think anyone ever beat him in a one to one. Mm. So the only way you could beat him was unfairly. And if you did beat him unfairly, he'd come back and get everyone here. Mm. So he had a, he was a legend and he still is a legend. Um, yeah, Johnny Andrews, really, really tough Scottish guy. How did you How did you think your career went in your 40s? You as a personality on the doors. Yeah, I like to think it went well. I I sort of I was one of these people. I was sort of like I would overachieve. So I remember when I got given um, when I got given the Zen's nightclub in Dartford. It was a it was the reason I got given it was because I was working for Luminar Leisure. It was a troublesome place. Um, it had two. It was like two nightclubs in one, and you had uh, fourteen door staff. <clears throat> Out of the fourteen, I think two of those were females, and I don't say that like in a derogatory way because I tell you what I've worked with some amazing yeah. female staff yeah. um and i had some really good ones up there um but it wasn't really enough staff to manage that venue because of the because of the people that were coming through it mm. and the things we had to deal with um when i when i actually left that contract they upped it to 20. yeah it wasn't like a little jump i mean like from 14 yeah. gosh 20 yeah. to try and control it um that place was awful um we had a lot of trouble uh, we had a lot of trouble with uh, some groups up there uh the, the gypsies were one of them <clears throat> my other good friend, Mr. Murray, uh, Lee Murray, mm -hmm. you know, the 50 million pound Murray. Yeah. I actually got on right with Lee and yeah. Paul. Um, yeah. And they were, they were, they were not a bad crowd. They were sort of a bit cheeky, but they were good. They were all right. But you had those sort of people in there. Mm -hmm. um, and you had to treat everyone a certain way. We had one guy in there, um, Alfie, and his older brother was a friend of mine. His older brother was a, a gypsy guy, Lenny. He's not here anymore. anymore. And, his young brother Alfie was out to make a name for himself, and uh, and he did. <laughs> he, and one night, anyway, one night as the club's closing, he's he had an argument with a fellow, and he's walking out of the club, and he's chin this guy, bosh, in the doorway, and he's knocked him out, spark out in the doorway. So now, and it's only a little doorway, so everyone now has have to step mm. over a body to get out at the end of the night, and it really wasn't the good way to end the night. Yeah. And it, and all being funny, there's a car park across mm. the road. You could have even waited just like <laughs> waited a minute. You could have knocked him out over there, and we wouldn't have even done anything. But anyway, so everyone's seen it. Everyone's seen him do it. And everyone's had to step over his body. So I, the manager went, I'm, I'm not having him in anymore. All right. So so I, I'll have to let him know he's barred. He went, you can't bar me. So I'm not, I'm not being barred. I said, you are barred. Because of what you've done. Mm. You, have to, you have to go away for like six months. Leave us alone. Anyway, so I, I wasn't working there every week. I used to visit there once a week. Um, normally on like a Thursday or someone's on a weekend. But I'd only pop in. I'd on, do it at three or four other clubs. So anyway, <clears throat> I got a phone call from the doorman. And, and, and what he'd done, he'd... Uh, He'd done like a drive-by. Um, oh, that's it, sorry. His older brother, who was my mate, rang me up. He said, Marcus, he said, look, I think my little brother's a bit upset about being banned. He said, and uh, he's nicked my favourite shotgun and sawed the barrels off it. He said, um, she don't hurt him. <laughs> so I mean, he said, I said, don't hurt him. I said, <laughs> you rang me up and tell me your brother's going to come and shoot me. He went, yeah, but don't hurt him. He's my little brother. Right? So I went, all right, I'll try not to. But anyway, so what's happened is I warned the doorman about it. Anyway, so he's, he's he's come along in his car, and it's like a there's like a long there's a, this this place has got like a glass reception area. It's really bad design, so it's really thick glass, but it's just all glass, yeah. so you, you can see everyone yeah. in the reception. Anyway, Elfie's driven along, open the window, and he's like he's hung he's hung his sawn off out the window, and he's pointing it at the reception at the at the doorman. 
and the doorman's in there, like, gun. So they're all like diving for cover, which looks mm. a bit shit, really. Yeah. You know I mean, so they're all diving for cover, and he's just he's laughing his bollocks off, and he's like, ah, and wanking, you know. Yeah. So anyway, but he didn't he didn't let any he didn't let any shots off. He just he just did that and 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 went. And then I think he stashed his car up wherever somewhere. And then he's then he's across the road, copping off, mm. and you know you can't bar me, blah 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 blah. Mm. And he's got a load of his gypsy mates with him. <clears throat> anyway, so they, they obviously told me about it that night. And I said, right, okay, well, how can we deal with this? Well, for starters, all the doormen wanted bulletproof vests now. So I had to buy five bulletproof vests from my front of house. <coughs> Sorry. And um, anyway, he carried on doing this and it went on week after week. And, and in the end, I, was, I said, right, when is it normally happening? So I, I thought, I've, I've got to be there. Oh, the head doorman was off. That's right. Head doorman was off. And that was that Ken guy I told you about. The yeah. Good one. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ken Hargreaves was off. So I thought I'd better go up and cover it myself in case this happens again. So I've gone up there and uh, and sure enough, here comes Alfie, and he's done the same thing again. But this time, I'm standing there, and I'm looking out the glass at him, and I didn't move. Yeah. <laughs> so he's pointing the gun at me, and I'm like, mm. <laughs> And anyway, I thought, right, only way I can do this, I think, we didn't have body cams in them days, and we didn't have a camera facing out there. So I went and bought a, a proper video camera, mm -hmm. yeah, a little video one. So I said to the door, right, listen, next time he does it, I want you to film it. I want it on film, so we've got him, his registration, and what he's doing you know, with the, with the gun. So at least we've got the ammunition to have him nicked if we want. Anyway, so my doorman did that. So now I've got the bulletproof vest on and the camera. And he's becoming a real nuisance. And he also, like I said, there'd be a crowd of gypsies over the road, like, you know, throwing stuff at you yeah. or taunting you. Anyway, so uh, he done it, they filmed it, and he's seen the camera. So now he's, he's rung me up. I want that film. You can't have, I want that film. You're a grass or what? I went, I went, I'm not. I said, if I was a grass, you'd already be nicked, you yeah, twat. Yeah. I said, I've got a lovely bit of film with you on it. Though. I said, I've got a lovely bit of film with you right, waving your gun out of your car and your registration and everything. I said, if I wanted you nicked, you'd be nicked. He said, well, what do you want then? I said, what I'd like is a peaceful life. Yeah. <laughs> I'd really like it. I said, if you wasn't there. I said, you are barred. You know that. I said, bugger off for a month. Leave us alone. I said, let me have time to think about it. So anyway, for one month, we had like a, we had an Alfie free zone, <laughs> right? Uh, and it was good. And he, he just stayed away. He'd done what he said. So anyway, I sort of sat and thought about it. I thought, I don't really, I didn't want to get someone nicked. So that wasn't really yeah. the reputation I was after either. Yeah. So... I, I got one of the guys, I said, look, can you contact Archie and uh, tell him, uh, sorry, Alfie, tell Alfie I want to see him. Mm. So Alfie, I said, on his own. No, I don't want to see the rest of them. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, I've missed a really big story. Sorry, so after the, before before I come to the resolve, sorry, after the event of him being filmed, he, uh, he's he gone round, he's gone round, he's, I said, he used to stash the car and come round. So this one this one particular day, he's done that and, he's, and he used to then appear at the other side of the road, it was a big car park and he had about 50 gypsies with him. And anyway, so he's gone to stash his car and I went to the dorm and I said, look, you stay here. I'm going across the road. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going over there to talk to the gypsies. Mm. They went, you can't go over there on your own. I said, I am. I said, I don't want to go there firm handed, right? I want to, mm. I've got to do this on my own. Yeah. I want to speak to Alfie. So I, I, I marched across the road and I told, expressly told the dormant to stay where they were. So as I've got there, I said, I, all the gypsies looked at me. I went, where's Alfie? And he'd just, he just been waving the gun at us. So I, went, I said, where is Alfie? Right? And they're all going, Whoa. and then Alfie appeared through the back of the crowd. I said, all right, Alfie, I said, where's your gun? Where's your gun? Shoot me. All right? I said, shoot me now. I said, you're still going to be barred from the club. All right? And, he went, he's, and anyway, the gypsies all started laughing. I thought, I'm on one here. <laughs> so I thought, oh, wait, I'll tell you what, after you shot me, I said, you can shoot them if you want. I said, and you'll still be barred from the club. Well, I said, I'll tell you what. And then they laughed even more, right? I thought I'm definitely on one here. So I went, I said, after you've shot all them, I said, you can burn the club down if you want. We'll build a new one and you'll be barred from that. I said, are you getting it through your head? You're yeah. barred. You're not coming in. Right? And they're all going, they're all laughing. And he's going, oh, nice. And at that point, I just turned around and walked back before we had time to really <laughs> think about it. So I actually, I'm, 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 I'm asked, I was going, oh, I think, yeah. right? But it worked, right? So through a bit of humour, I suppose, so that sort of, I mean, it just caught him off guard because, I mean, no one expects someone mm. to walk up and go, go on in, shoot yeah. me. Plus, he didn't have the gun. It was in the car anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so anyway, that's that's what I did, and uh, and then and then like I said, we had the recording of him, and then after that, uh, we had about a month apiece, and then I said, I called him in. I went, look, Alfie. I went, you've been you've been good. You stayed away. I said, give it another couple of months. Stay away for another couple of months. I said, I'll probably let you back in again. Just behave yourself, mm -hmm. right? Just don't antagonise it, everyone. I went, and there's your video. There's your, there's your film. The tape back. And I gave him his tape, and he was like, oh, he goes, you're not such a bad geezer, are you? Yeah. I went, no, I'm not just, I, all I want is peace. Yeah. All right? I just, you did something wrong. You've got to be punished. You couldn't come in. We've got, you know, they, they don't want you in. But you will get back in if you play it right. Yeah. But you won't get back in by telling us you're coming mm. in. You know? 
So that was it, really. I mean, it's a, yeah, it was a bit of a mad way to deal with it. Yeah. Have you ever done any debt collecting? Yeah, I was, I, I've done a bit of debt collecting. I'm not saying I was great at it. Um, I was always getting offered stuff like that because everyone, when you're big and you're known and you're like, I've got a debt you need to do and all this. Um, so back in the day, yeah, we, we did a few things and it didn't all work out good, to be honest. I can think of a few. Um, big Lloyd, who I told you, used to work with, right? So we, we used to have a mate who, had, who was a car dealer, um, Jerry Mullins. And uh, he sent us on a couple of jobs. Well, one, one of the jobs he sent us on, we both actually backfired. The first one was quite funny. We had gone to this uh, place near Canterbury in a town called Hurston. And he said, oh, the guy that owns this guy is a great big fella, so I need two great big fellas to go in and talk to him. Anyway, so we, he did, what he didn't tell us was the full story. So we'd gone in there. We sort of got up for ourselves, you know, reared up to go <laughs> in. And uh, when we'd gone into this guy, he's sitting behind a desk. So I'd gone in there and went, listen, um, we, we've come here to sort this out. You owe some money. Daddy haven't paid for this car or whatever. And all of a sudden, he's gone like that. And he's pulled, he pulled out a drawer. Right? We thought, shit, he's got a gun. Right? <laughs> so we were all going kind of on the back foot. And he's, and he's pulled out a, a, like a bat. And he started smashing the desk up. Right? <laughs> and then he's wheeled himself around in a wheelchair. Oh, no. Right? And we're going, fuck. He didn't tell us he was a cripple, <laughs> right? So he sent us in a, like, a raspberry, you know? So yeah. anyway, I'm over there. He's, he's cornered me in the room and he's pulled off the foot bit, right? And he's beating me with it. Right? And my mate Lloyd's in the door like that. So I mean, okay, like, calm down, calm down. Yeah. Can you fuck off? <laughs> so I mean, we went there to pick a debt up, uh, two great big fellas, but we wasn't, he didn't tell us about that. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to start punching a guy in a yeah, wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was, he was like, he was like beating the crap out of me, so we had to leave <laughs> without the money or the car. How did you? How did you uh, react at that moment, thinking I've gone in there, you g'd oh, yourself up, and all of a sudden, what? No one's giving me the. I mean, I wish you'd have told us. I mean, we wouldn't. Have, we probably wouldn't have done it in the yeah. first place. You know, yeah. you're not going to go and like like two great big heavies go and put it on some poor fellow yeah. in a wheelchair. But I, I'm not sure to be honest. Someone, someone afterwards told me that he wasn't really in a wheelchair. He was like, waiting on a claim or something, and he, he had actually got exactly. two good legs. Yeah, so I'm I sure probably, probably, should, probably should have given us mate. <laughs> But anyway, that was one of the jobs we did for Jerry. And then another one, it was in Whitstable. And um, it was, again, it was over a car. But Jerry said he wanted to go himself on this one. Oh, that was it. Now, I'd, I'd, I was actually, in, I had my right arm in plaster at the time. Yeah. Um, that's a completely other story. Um, but this was, uh, yeah, you know that where the motorbike outside the club? Yeah. Yeah, so um, anyway, I had this, this arm in plaster. And I said, look, I'm not really up for debt collection. I said, I can't do much. My hand, mm. was, my hand was actually fixed like that. Yeah. I couldn't make a fist. Um, and uh, he said, I just, I just need someone big to stand behind me. He said, I'm going to go and talk to him. He said, you just stand outside. So again, me and Lloyd went with him. And so we've gone there and he had this big like, big car showroom and he's gone into the office. I'm standing outside the office, but I'm looking for a window so I can keep an eye on him. And the guy, I think his name was Moxley. Yeah. And uh, he was a big old lump, an old boy, but a big lump. Anyway, they started talking and then the, the talking got a bit, you know, agitated and it, it got a bit loud. And all of a sudden this Moxley's turned around, grabbed a socket wrench and just smashed this guy over the head with it. I mean, proper, just decked him, right? I mean, I thought he caved his head in. Yeah. So I thought, shit. So I've, I've, I've run into the office. but I've run in there and then gone, oh, shit. I've, I've only got one hand, right? I've got this one like that in a plaster cast. <laughs> so I thought, so I grabbed this fella and I've grabbed him as hard as I could and I've run him backwards. So he's off, he's off, he's off balance yeah. sort of thing. So I've run him backwards and smashed him into the wall. So I've got him pinned there, but I've only got this one arm on him and he's managed to get his arm with a the, with the socket wrench. And he's gone, smash over the top of my head. And I went, oh, and he's gone, Smash! And I thought, shit! And I went, Lloyd. <laughs> I'm kind of expecting Lloyd to come in. I don't think Lloyd was paying attention. <laughs> anyway, so I got it. I got it sort of a few times, and it, and it was. I thought he was going to cave me in. And um, anyway, I've got, I was really pissed off. This. So I've, 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 I've given him. I've given him. A, I've clumped him with me plaster cast. Right. That's all I could do. Really, was like hitting him with the plaster cast. And then, I've, and I've got me mate Jerry, and I've literally still unconscious. I've dragged him out of the door to get him out to safety. So I've, I've, I've been, I've, my head's, you know, got holes all over in it. Lucky I've got a really, really hard head, by the way. <laughs> um, so anyway, I've dragged him out. And now all of his workers are coming out of the, of the workshop and they've all got tools on them as well. So I thought, shit. So I've, I'm, I'm, I'm really angry now. I've got holes in my head I've, 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 and, I've, and I've got my plaster cast and I'm just breaking bits off my plaster cast so I can actually make a fist. <laughs> and I've run back in and I've got hold of this, I've got hold of this Moxley fella and I've shoved him over one of his cars and I'm battering <laughs> the shit out of him. And I've, 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 I'm probably breaking my hand again. But anyway, and then all of a sudden I felt uh, someone's grabbed my arm and it's a policeman. So there's like the old bill of there, they're all over us and we all got arrested. Oh. And uh, so we all went to we all went to uh, Herne Bay Police Station. I think it was Herne Bay or Whitstable. I think it was Herne Bay. Anyway, and uh, we had to we stayed there overnight. We had an overnight stop, and uh, and then we all had to go to court the next day. So it, this Moxley was in the court as well, and all his face is black and blue. I punched the shit out of him. Um, but on my head's all like I've got all stitches. I think they put forty stitches in my head. They had to take me to Canterbury Hospital 
to get my head stitched up. And while I was there, I said to the woman, I went, I said, can you x-ray me in? She went, what do I x-ray for? She said, well, I said, I got hit about six, seven times with a socket wrench. I went, I think I might have fractured my skull. And she went, I can see your skull. She said, it's <laughs> <laughs> she said I can see you. I can see your skull. It's, it's got a chip in it, but it's all right. <laughs> so, yes, I had like 40 odd stitches in my head. When you're on bits of work like that, do you want the money up front or are you going and going 50 no, 50 or how's it work? It was a, we, to be honest, I think this was, this was, he was a mate anyway. So we, this was, I can't even remember if we got paid for it or not. Yeah. We didn't, we obviously didn't, we didn't get, it didn't get resolved properly. Um, we all got, we all got bound over. I got banned from Whitstable for a year and bound over to keep the peace. Yes, I was like, I was really lucky, really, because I mean, it should have been like a violent, you know, violent mm. public disorder or an affray, or it could have gone all sorts of ways, really. Uh, but yeah, that, that was it. That, so that was that, so debt collecting wasn't really <laughs> wasn't for me. <laughs> I've been, I've got friends who do it. I've got friends that are licensed debt collectors, and and when you go out with them, it's all done, it's all done properly, and they're quite clever about the way they do it as well. Mm. But um, but there was one more which just sticks in my mind. One of one of my, you quite often get people who don't want to pay their bill. Yeah, so I had this one guy. We did a so what paying your bill for the yeah, door? Yeah, for the security. So the security. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, down in Eastbourne way, we got, uh, my area manager down. He said, "Oh, it was over Christmas New Year. We we do a lot of extra stuff on Christmas and New Year's." And uh, this one people, the one one person hadn't paid, and it got to it was no, it was the summer. You know, they had like eight months to pay it. Anyway, I rang the guy up, got hold of him. Never seen the guy before. I mean, it, my area manager arranged it. We'd done the work. We didn't get paid, mm. and it was like I don't know, a couple of grand, you know, say over Christmas New Year. So I rang him up and the fellow went, I'm not paying you. Simple as that. I said, why not? He goes, don't want him. <laughs> really? So I thought, okay. Obviously, haven't met me. Anyway. <laughs> so I said to him, I said to him, I said, send me his address. And I said, I don't know. What does he look like? He said, oh, he said, oh, I don't know. And he spoke to him on the phone. So I thought, all right. So I was going down to Brighton that week so, and then back to Eastbourne. So on my way through, I, I found this pub. And it was a pub with a big restaurant. So I'm all suited and booted anyway because I'm going to work. And uh, I sort of got one in there. And I said, um, I said, I said, I'm still doing food. I said, I'll have a table for one. So I ordered the most expensive steak I could. I ordered a really nice bottle of Chablis, yeah. most expensive one I could. And then the waitress came back after I'd sort of more or less finished. And she said, um, how was the steak? I went, shit. I said, it's the worst steak I've ever had in my life. She went, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Should you, would you want to speak to the owner? I said, love to. Because <laughs> I had no idea which one he was, right? I had no idea. So anyway, this little fella's come over and he said, um, she said, something wrong with the steak? I said, actually, no, I said, it's the best steak I've ever had. I said, but you ain't paid your bill, you twat. <laughs> <laughs> so and by this time he sat down and he was all like, he said, he said, you can't come in here and threaten me. I said, I think I just did. Yeah. <laughs> I said, look, mate, I said, we gave you we gave you what you wanted. I said, well, why do you think you can't pay? I said, I've sat here. I said, your, your restaurant's good, your food's good, you've got customers everywhere, you've got bar staff, you've got a stock bar. Yeah. I said, so what on earth is going through your mind when you think you can have my staff work here all over Christmas and New Year on a free and then just decide yeah. not to pay me? Yeah. I said, you're lucky that I'm older and I'm wiser and I'm not like, dragging you out of the car park mm. and play the tune on your fucking kneecaps yeah. with Emma. Yeah. I said, because 20 years ago, you'd have probably just got battered. I said, but I'm, I'm trying to be nice. Yeah. And all I really want is paying. I said, so just pay your bill, right? I said, well, you did. It took him about a week. <laughs> but yeah, so have you, you know, when you're running a big firm like that, did you get up to 200 men? And when you've got 200 men, you've obviously got, you're putting managers in the right place. Have you ever put the wrong manager <clears throat> into, a, into a nightclub you've, you've, you've regretted? I did that definitely once in uh, in Dartford. Yeah, I, I I was I was stuck for a head doorman, and uh, a guy who was actually a good friend of mine, um, and not a bad guy, I thought. But I, so I gave him. He, he said, "Look, I'll, I'll do it if you run it for you temporarily. Temporarily, I'll, 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 until you can find a do head doorman, I'll do it. I'll take care of it, babysit it." And he, he did quite a good job. And he was in there for I think about like a month or something. And I was due to go to Thailand. And then what it was, the, the police had been sniffing around because I think in his spare time. He wasn't a full time doorman. I think in his spare time he was doing a little bit of dealing or something. And I and I like I said before, I can't have any involvement with that running my door firm. So um I said to him, Look, the police have been asking questions about you and you know, I can't if, if I can't have you being my head doorman. It doesn't look good. If you're if said, no, I'll stop I'll stop dealing, I'll stop dealing. Oh yeah, but you're not gonna are you? I said, because you, you don't earn that much money from me, you're gonna earn more money out of your mm. dealing. So you're not gonna stop dealing. I said, Look, let's just let's just part ways, you know. You done you said you do it temporary, you've got to go. He said, Well, I'm not leaving. He liked the power trip, right? Yeah. He liked it. So he went, oh, well, I'm not leaving. I said, right, you're sacked. Yeah. Now you've got to leave, <laughs> So you're sacked. I can't have you working yeah. here. And I'm going to Thailand. I need to put another red doorman in. I've found someone now. So anyway, uh, I got all these messages. I'm in Thailand. I got all these messages. I said, oh, Matt's not happy about what's happening. He's going to he's gonna bring 50 geezers down. 50 of his mates are coming down and smash the club up on a Thursday night. And Thursday night, we only had seven doormen. On the weekend, we had 14. So it was a good night to pick to smash yeah. it up. Anyway, so I said, no, he ain't got that many mates. I said, can't, surely it can't work. Anyway, apparently it was true. And all I was getting was barrage of phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. So I, I said, right, so I've, I, I can't just get back from Thailand. I've got to try and 
So I thought, right, first thing I did, I, I reinforced the team. So I, I rung five great big lumps up. And they weren't actually badge doormen. They were just big, nasty geezers. Mm -hmm. I paid them like 150 quid each or something, 100 pound each a night to just to be sitting in there as customers. So now you've got seven doormen and five monsters, yeah. right, in case. Because I still didn't think it was going to happen. But then as it got closer to the day, more and more people said, it's happening, it's happening. Like the more and more whispers coming back, you know, the, the old Bush Telegraph, as it yeah. were. So um, <clears throat> anyway, I rung everyone that I could think of on my naughty list and no one really wanted to play. It was it was looking pretty naughty. Mm. Till I rung a fella and I can only, I won't give you his full name, but he's known as Proper Chopper, right? Because um, he normally carries an axe. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he's mental. Uh, he's a nice guy, crazy. And I rang him up. I, said, I told him the full story and he went, yeah, because I'll do it. No problem. I said, no, no, no. I said, don't, don't, I said, don't, don't speak, do it for nothing. I said, yeah. I'll, I'll pay you. Yeah. I said, because I, I need a team of guys to come down. I don't actually trust the whole door team. I don't think they're going to stand up to it. And they know this guy because he was the head doorman. Mm. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to feel it stuck in the middle a little bit. Anyway, so two carloads came from London and it cost me five grand, right? And the extra money I'd paid for the other guys. Mm. So I think the whole night in the end cost me about seven grand. But... um but anyway, so and, and he said, "What do you need?" He said, "Yeah, we're gonna we'll turn up. We're gonna turn up properly at all." I'm like, "Okay." And, and I actually, I've really had the hunt with this guy. By this time, he's gobbing off to everyone what he's gonna do. And in fact, I was actually, I would have been quite happy if he got shot. To yeah. be honest, right? But that yeah. it wasn't the instructions. The instructions was not to let him in and not to smash the place up. Anyway, what actually happened on the night? They did turn up with about fifty strong. So they've all. He's managed to get a massive crowd of lunatics together. And when they got to the club, they oh sorry, I rang the I rang the manager of the club up. He was the only one who knew the plan. I rang the manager up and I said, look, I said, there's eight guys coming from London. I said, uh, on a stag do. I said, don't search them. They're mates of mine. Just let them in. Yeah. Just let them in for free. They're my VIP guests. Don't don't tell anyone anything else. They're, they're just there to make sure it don't happen. Anyway, so the, the 50 strong parties turned up and smashed the place up. The doorman actually let them in. Just just opened the door. Just They were going to just let them through. And at that point, my mate, my mate Chopper, he's come out in reception and suddenly he went, right, you lot. We're searching every one of you. You're not coming in without a search. And all the doormen going, who are you? He said, we're mates of Marxists and we're sorting this out. You obviously don't do your job properly. Right? So he he, he searched everybody. I didn't really want to let him, let, let him in, yeah. but he let them all in. He searched everyone, made sure properly searched them so they had no weapons on them. Yeah. Then he took this guy outside and <laughs> stuck one in his face and went, if you know anybody, he went, in my world, go and ring them. He said, and tell them you've just met Chopper. <laughs> he said, because if a blast gets broken in there, or you don't pay for a drink, you're going to get one in your nut and you're going first. So he shit himself, right? He's properly, absolutely. Now, bearing in mind, he spent about two weeks building this army up to come down to smash the place up. You know, coming we're going to wreck it. Now he's inside going, pay for your drinks, don't break a glass. <laughs> da, 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 right? So, you know, anyway, so I, I then I rung, I rung, I'd already told my mate, I said, listen, when, you, when it gets to the end of the night, I said, there's only one person I actually really trust in there. And he's the manager. So whatever weapons you've brought with you, anything at all, you give to him. He said, no, no, no. I said, no, you've got to do it. You've got to give them to him. They're going to be locked in the safe. I'm back in three or four days from Thailand. I will return them to you lot in North London. But I I'm worried about the fact, because this guy's a bit, I think he's a bit of a grass. Yeah. And you're, you've just, you, they know now you've, you've tooled up. Yeah. And they were, they were literally, they had armor piercing rounds and they had bulletproof vests and they were naughty as anything. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> they left all the stuff there with the manager. And uh, and sure enough, on their way home, uh, they all got spun by the police. All the cars, the cars got stopped and uh, you know searched and they got searched. And he went, I said, you, you must be like a witch. <laughs> and he said, you, he said, exactly what you said was going to happen. Yeah. Happened. And I said, listen, I'm glad you listened to me. And I came back, I came back like, oh, actually the next day I rung this fella up, the one that caused the problem. I said, all right. I said, because uh, when I, I rang him up before and I said to him, I said, I don't think you're going to come down with 50 mates. You ain't got 50 mates. Yeah. You're, you're unpopular. And he went, he went, no, I'll do it anyway. When it, after the day after he'd done it, I said, oh, I said, you, you came in. He goes, yeah, we got in. I said, yeah, you did get in. I said, and, uh, and you all paid for your drinks and you didn't cause any trouble. I said, let us know when you come in. We'll put some extra bar staff on next time. <laughs> Quality. <Right. laughs> and uh, anyway, so three days later, I had this horrible drive to do. I had to go to the club in Dartford. I had to pick up all these things and from knuckle dusters to knives, <laughs> guns. I like, car was full of it. I'm thinking, oh no. And I had to drive them around to North London and drop them all back to someone's house. I and I was shitting myself. Yeah, okay. But it, I, you know, it, but it, it, again, it went out there in the sort of, in our world, if you like, um, the story of what I'd done. And so, it, again, it, it, it's, it's a big risk. Yeah. Right. It was a big risk in those days. But 
it, it actually had some in some ways it worked out all right for me because no one did get shot yeah. no one got hurt but the, the bad people didn't do the bad things yeah and a lot of other people who might have thought about doing bad things never did stopped yeah so yeah what club was that was that zen's yeah zen's okay, club, okay. Yeah. and was that the naughtiest club you've ever done Probably about the naughtiest, yeah, I'd yeah. say. I mean, there was a, there's, you've always got, but that was there was yeah, there was a lot of incidents there. There's a hell of a lot that you know went on it on a, on a weekly basis. Yeah. It was pretty, it was pretty bad, and because it, it had some very naughty people that used to frequent it. Yeah. So you know, yeah, you. I mean, I, when, I had a brand new car uh, when I went there once. A brand new BMW, not brand new. I'd, I'd paid like twenty five, thirty grand for this car, best car I'd ever had. And I used to, I used to park it like about five hundred meters away around a little, you know, a little tiny back road, and they found it. <laughs> <laughs> I got, and I got there one night, and it was like it was just like a pile of broken glass and, and a breeze block on the back seat. You know, I mean, they they tore down a garden wall and just pummeled it to yeah. bits. I mean, it had to be towed away. And oh yeah, I mean, luckily I had fully comp insurance, but it was, um, yeah, it was it was a bit a bit soul destroying. And I, and that was one of the places where I used to wear a bulletproof vest to go in and to go out of work. Mm. Because I wasn't that popular there. <laughs> and what year are we talking here? Do you have those doors for? The I, was, I was about 40 then, so about 20 years ago. So, yeah, 20 years. Yeah, so Early 2000, 2003, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And what was the relationship like? What was your thought process when you were in Thailand? You're stuck in Thailand. Did you feel... I felt helpless. Helpless, that's what um, I'm saying. But you had good men around you going to sort it out. But what was the feeling like when you landed back? I bet you're dying to get back. Yeah. Did you go and see that Matt fella? We never... No, I've, I've never, never, ever bumped into him to this day. Okay. Never. Um, yeah, when it was all going on, I offered to meet him, and he, he didn't want to know. No. <laughs> Not surprised. No. <laughs> have you had any? Have you ever had any offers to 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 work on TV? Any films, movies, anything? Yeah, yeah. I started doing a. It was really funny. I went. I was meant to go and play a security guard or something, or a security or dawn in in a Spice Girls movie. And so I, one of my mates was doing it, and he, he said, "Oh, I need extras." So I turned up there with my like, dinner jacket and bow tie and all that. You know, and we went, oh, she says, you look great. She's like, I want you like that. So I was in a T-shirt like this. Went, I want you, I want you, you stand over there. So I was, if you actually, if you get the Spice Girls movie, I've got hair then. <laughs> but uh, if you watch it, I'm actually in the background. I think I've got like a stripy top on or something like, where's Wally top? And, you know, <laughs> and done bleached hair. But um, but that started a, a thing off and I quite enjoyed it. So I started doing extra work and um, and then I got some bigger bits. And then, and then I did one, which was a, a Channel 4 series called Lockstop. Um, so it was like a spin-off from the film. But it was there were seven episodes, and I think I was in five of them. I played the minder to the bad guy, mm. and that was in a, that was a funny time. A funny time at that time because I was then knocking around with Mr. Courtney, mm. who was a bald gangster in mm. London, and this guy who I was on the set with was a bald gangster in London driving a white Rolls Royce. <laughs> so there was a very sort of lot of similarities, and I was actually wearing for the part because they hadn't got any props or clothes to fit me. So I was wearing what I would wear on the front door on a weekend. Mm. So I was wearing like a black suit, black shirt, black tie, and I was got this big leather coat on, I had big sideburns down here. Um, but that was exactly how I looked when I was working on the streets. Mm. And I was in a film playing mm. the minder. So it was really funny, it was quite surreal. But it was it was a, a lot of fun until they didn't pay me. <laughs> did they not pay? No, I did months and months of work and they just dissolved the company and disappeared. Oh. It was like an extra company, I can't remember what it was called, Early Call I think it was called. Yeah. Yeah, bastards. <laughs> have you had any other close calls with people who have pulled any guns on you? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, yeah. Um, Folkestone uh, was a naughty one. Um, I, I just turned up there one night doing my visits. Um, so I'd, I'd been, I was all suited and booted. I just carried a little briefcase with all my paperwork and spare bits and pieces in it. And I turned up there. I, I, I think I had two or three bars to visit that night, but I'd gone to Folkestone. And like you say, you've always got this sort of head on a swivel. And um, I was talking to the guys on the front door, and this, but I noticed this guy, he's, he's, he's digging around in the back of a red BMW, like a little three series, like, only a few cars down from the front door. So I said to the guys, what's, what's, what's your story? What, you know, you just kicked him out or something. They went, yeah, he was doing drugs in the toilet. Booted him out, he's an idiot, idiot. I said, don't worry about him, you know, he'll go away. You're not coming back in. Anyway, I, I was talking to them, but I've still got one eye on this fella. And he's rummaging around, he's obviously looking for something. Mm. All of a sudden he's found it. He's pulled his Desert Eagle 50 out. Have you ever seen one? No. Oh, mate, it's like a 50 caliber pistol. It's like a <laughs> they'll shoot through walls. Yeah. They were they were they were made. I mean, uh, they were made to clear buildings because if someone stands behind a wall, you just shoot them through it. That's like they're a 50 caliber round. Yeah. So he's firing shells like this, and and in a second you've got this. Like, I mean, I was like, everyone's got a gun and everyone's everyone's gone that way. I actually ran that way. Yeah. I ran straight at him. I don't know. Maybe I'm just mad, but I. <clears throat> I had like, you don't have a second to think about it. You know, the geezer's just, I was just keeping an eye on him and he's, all of a sudden he's gone whoosh, like that. And as he's pulled it out, he's just he's just come running towards the door with a gun held high like that. So I sort of ran straight at him, but I was sort of rugby tackling. I went underneath his arm, smashed into him as hard as I could and I ploughed him straight into a car. 
Um, and then I've managed to get my arm over the top of him. And I've managed to tell yeah, the car yeah. a little bit, arm up his back, yeah. and pulled the gun out of his hand, threw the gun across the pavement. Um, and luckily for me, at that, at that time, a police car just happened to come round the corner. We didn't have to call one, and I just waved him down. I was like, "This geezer, here's a gun," wow. oh, <laughs> and that God. was it. But I mean, that'd have, that'd have put holes for everyone. Jesus, you know? what what made you want to run straight at him? I don't know. I don't know. Like I keep hearing the same the same thing. You're running straight at him. Like, yeah. I don't think in my in my mind you don't have probably if you had time to think about it. I don't think you'd probably do that. Mm. But it's you've got a split second, so you know it's the same. Like I remember some guys coming to the door once, and they were all tooled up with knives, and uh, they. Uh, we totally kicked him out and they must have gone home got some knives and they, they come back and it was quite plain to see that they've got like the handles of the knives yeah. under their shirts yeah and there was three of them and they come to the door and they wanted to have a go at the doorman who chucked them out and, and I wasn't that doorman but I was the head doorman so I've, and I, but I've gone right out to them and everyone's going they've got, they've got knives on they've got knives on and everyone can see it but I went right up to them face to face so I'm literally nose to nose with the guy and I'm arguing with him I'm going you ain't coming back in you've been put out once you've got to go now you know that's it we're not getting in and, uh, and everyone's thinking, you know, everyone's sort of trying to warn me. But I knew, I knew he had the knife. Anyway, t luckily, they backed down and they actually left. Right? And when I walked back in, the dog went to me, are you mad? What are you doing? You know, the guy's got a knife. We can all see it. I said, look, I said, think about it logically. If I'm a metre away from him, I can't disarm him. Mm. I, he's got time to pull it mm. and plunge me. Mm. If I'm that close to him... He can't get he, yeah. he, But by the time he does yeah. anything here... Yeah. I'm on him. Yeah. I'm there. I'm. I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to grab his yeah. arms and snap yeah. him in the face yeah. or <laughs> bite his nose off. I'll do anything. Oh, but I, he's not going to put that knife in me. Yeah. But, uh, because that's so. I'm going to get closer to the problem, whereas most people would probably stay further back from mm. the problem. But then that doesn't give you any sense of control mm. at all. You're going to probably get stabbed. Mm. So yeah, it's always been. I don't know, not always been, but just yeah. I'm just something can probably clicks in my head, and I just go. Mm. Straight, I go for it rather than go the other way. <laughs> Yeah. It's worked out all right. It's so worked far. out all right, isn't it? Yeah. Is there is there anything, Marcus? That like all the years, forty years on the doors, you've seen everything, you clock everything, you're very good at what you do. Um, is there any one regret you've got? One regret. One regret. Uh, what regarding my work, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, there is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is one regret. I didn't, it didn't it didn't sit very comfortable with me for a long time working at a club in Margate we had a we had a we had a, we had a coach party and we had a Beano in I think it was a stag do or something and um, but they kicked off they kicked off a big fight and there was only I think it was three or four of us to deal with it so we were fighting a coach party again and uh, and we got them out but then they, 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 they came back with bottles and bins and they just tried to they attack the doors mm. and they and we ended up fighting out on the pavement with them and uh, and it was a proper scrap you know it just went on and on and on and in the end, I'm, I'm going to say, well, I think we've knocked a few of them out. And, and, uh, and they've, yeah, we've, we've, we've been, you know, punches of both sides. But there's one guy I really wanted to get him. <laughs> and uh, you're actually not far from the cliff there. Mm. And I, I chased this guy. And I'm like, I said, I'm not a good runner. So it wasn't, I was like, I'm, I'm hobbling along behind him trying to catch this fellow. And he's running like a lunatic, looking over his back. And he got to what he obviously thought was a fence. And uh, he ducked through it because I was chasing him. But it wasn't a fence. Well, it was a fence to the cliff. Oh, no. And he went, whoa. So, don't think it ended too well. Yeah. But that, yeah, that that particular one sort of like, you know, it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't planned. I didn't want, I didn't expect him to be running off a cliff. Um, but yeah, that one, that one haunted me for quite a long time because I don't really know whether he made it or not. Yeah. To be honest. Wow. Oh. Certainly went. It certainly went very well. I think he's yeah. definitely got bruises. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and your life at the moment: beautiful wife, <coughs> calm. You've stopped the doors. COVID is sort of putting an end to, to stay everything. Out of stay out of trouble. And tell me your sort of day to day now. Oh, day to day now, like I said, it's just trying to be healthy. I just I try and get up early. I don't go out very often. I go out for a meal, go out with the missus, and go out to see friends. But I just try and stay away from it all. Um, yeah, I certainly don't miss the bars or the clubs. Um, and because of my health reasons at the moment, I don't drink a lot. Yeah. So I don't do drugs. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't do anything. Yeah, pretty boring. Mm. But I'm just trying to be healthy. I just want to try and have a nice, you know, quiet end to my life, if yeah. you like. Yeah, just yeah. Be... How's it been for you since the last episode that we did? Your first episode, yeah, you know, all the up. comments. There's yeah. like six hundred odd comments of just brilliant comments. Of... Comments have been great. I mean, yeah, and thank you to everyone who's commented. I've I've replied to quite a few and. Uh, 
yeah, I've, I've, I've you know I've had sort of little chats with people. I mean, there's one little one little lad. I think he's only like I see about thirteen, and he said, oh, "I'm five foot eleven. I'm the same as you want to be a doorman." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and he, he sends me little messages down again, and I yeah. try and try and tell him he should, you know, study hard and get a job, and you know, mm. maybe do the doors as a part time. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but I've had I've had people from Australia contact me, and yeah. you know, who've been on the doors for years, and it's been it's been generally pretty good comments. You know, yeah, it's nice, and I hope I hope if if everyone wants to listen, then I'm happy to tell my stories. Yeah. Mate, this is a fascinating episode. Yeah. It's fascinating. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming all the way down again. It's all right. And doing doing this because this is blinding people who are listening. Are loving the stories. Mm, okay, <laughs> and, I'm more. <laughs> and I'm sure you got a load more as well. So who yeah, knows? Just, maybe even a part just, three. Just keep running out of time, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Marcus, you've been a star, mate. Thanks for your Thank honesty. You. Thank you. You're a gentleman. Good man. Thank you.